Okay. It looks like it looks like I'm back. I don't know what in the world that was. Gee whiz. Um so hopefully everybody finds uh this live stream. Um sorry about all that. I think I saw I had about like 20 25 some odd people um in the in the the previous one that that basically crashed and so forget forget going through the intro. Let's just pick it up um let's just pick it up from here cuz I don't I don't even know I don't even know what in the world happened there. That was super weird. And so I'm actually going to take that last live stream and dump it. Cuz I I really don't know what happened. Okay, so that's the live stream now. And this live stream. Bye-bye. Delete forever. Yes, I understand that I'm deleting it. Because it glitched. And I don't know why it glitched. So I hope everybody's able to um, come back and and, fi and find uh, this live stream. It, it should be under the, the same thing. Um, I see that I got at least four people in here again if you're at least one of the or there's six now so if you're one of the six from the last live stream I'm sorry for the uh, the the technical difficulties um, that I had there so hopefully I won't have um, any issues this time but we'll see so what I wanted to yeah th uh, thanks for coming back guys I, I have no idea what happened um, and why my my stream just froze up like that? So I just had to start everything back over and forget going through the uh, the intro and stuff. And so I'm just gonna pick up where I left off, and that is I wanted to show everybody um, something that'll hopefully help them understand um, why they might not know when I publish a new video or even when I go live, because I did see that on the tail end of my last live stream where someone was asking how come YouTube doesn't notify me that Chris went live and so what I want to show you is this if you look at my YouTube channel you'll notice that every one of the channels that I'm subscribed to first and foremost are not listed here so this is one YouTube bug that already exists but another thing that I want to show y'all is that when you look at some of my featured uh, YouTube channels you'll see that underneath some of them they say the word subscribe and you'll see that underneath others it says subscribed that ends with um, the uh, that ends with the letter D at the end versus the other ones that do not. Now I want you to look at this list over here on the left of my subscriptions um, as well. These are the channels that I'm subscribed to. The channels of which, if you look here and you see that it's subscribed as in past tense, you will also see that when I expand the list. We look at Matchroom Pool, Matchroom Pool is here, FX Billiards, FX Billiards is here, Jaworski Pool Practice, whoops, um, Jaworski Pool Practice, etc., etc. But when I come back over here to some of the featured channels, Dr. Dave Billiards, y'all know he's one of my favorite YouTube channels to watch. But if I go over here to where all the, uh, the D channels are, we got Dave S and Draw Nation Pool Stream. We don't see Dr. Dave. That's odd. And another interesting thing, Dr. Dave just posted a video. Um, let's see if it shows up on my home screen. You can see my live stream here, and here it is. Here's Dr. Dave's latest video posted two hours ago. So let's go look at his channel, though. And you'll notice here that when I come look at his channel, I am subscribed. But on my YouTube channel, it just says subscribe doesn't end with the letter D and then you'll notice this little bell icon here and if I click this bell icon you can see that I can change it from personalized to all or leave it at none and because I have it personalized I actually didn't know Dr. Dave um, published a new video until I saw that he advertised it on Facebook 
So if YouTube isn't going to place Dr. Dave in this subscription list and then show me that he has new videos, especially when I come and click uh, the subscriptions uh, uh, feed here, then what I have to do is change this to all. From the bell notification, change it from personalized to change it to all. And then you'll see up here in the upper right hand corner where I have the bell uh, for notifications is turned on. You'll see when all new notifications come on. So for example, here's the pool player podcast. Here's a notification uh, for the pool player podcast that because uh, they did a live stream. I think it was, yeah, one day ago. Let's go look at the pool player podcast um, on my channel. See here where it says subscribe and not subscribed. Let's see if I can zoom in and see if this will help. Not the same thing as the Cue It Up podcast that says subscribed. But if I go click on the Pool Player podcast, you will see that I'm subscribed and I have the bell notification uh, changed from personalized to all. And because I have it set to all, Whenever um, the Pool Player Podcast does something, I'm going to be notified of it. So if you happen to be subscribed to my YouTube channel and you're not getting notifications of when I publish a new video or when I go live, this is the reason why. Because you have to uh, click on this bell notification icon and change it from personalized to all. So I want that to, to be out there for everybody uh, so that uh, they can follow along. And it's not just for my channel. Think about other channels that you might be following that have the same exact thing. And so hopefully that makes sense and will allow you to be able to follow better uh, the channels at which you are subscribed to. So I'll leave that here in this live stream for people to hopefully watch. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but yeah, that's that's the reason why um that has to be the reason why you're not getting notified whenever I do live streams, whenever I publish new videos. So like I said, if you're subscribed to me and you don't already have that bell notification changed from personalized to all, please do so if you want to quote unquote actively follow me. If you don't want to actively follow, that's fine. You just have to quote unquote be lucky that when you go to your YouTube homepage, that my videos will pop up on the home feed, because otherwise you might just you, you might just miss like any new content um, from me. So I hope oh, I hope I didn't hurt anybody's ears by doing that. So I hope that makes sense uh, to everybody. So let's see here. Let's go down the line and see who's all in here. We got Persistent Wolf Billiards. Good to see you again. Wayne Berber, Trevor Simpson. Good to see you again. Nine ball and eight ball. Um, playing with that J flowers? Uh, no, not uh, not recently. Uh, uh, the J flowers stuff uh, is still um, way down the line because uh, I got more uh, J flower equipment that I got eventually um, review. And who knows? Maybe I'll give it away. Bang time pool. Welcome back, bud. Uh, let's see. Tribe of uh, Benjamin. What tips do you recommend? The ones that you like. Um, uh, if you if you've uh, followed me enough. Uh, you know that you should know that I don't really do recommendations when it comes to um, Q equipment uh, because it's all personal preference. Um, anything that I can potentially tell you uh, that I that I think is great and wonderful, I would tell you that it's great and wonderful to me, uh, but it might not be great and wonderful to you. So I don't want to put myself in a position where you can say to somebody, "Well, little Chris recommended that I do this, and I and I tried it, and I hate it," because then you're just going to put the blame on me and not take responsibility of just making a decision. So you really just have to play around with uh, stuff like that. So I will answer your question in regards to I currently use Victory Soft Tips because that's what comes on my 12.9 Revo shafts. So I used to shoot with medium tips. I had a uh, Kamui Clear medium on my Viking. And even my Sean has a medium tip on it. But once I got my Revo shaft and that came with a soft tip and after playing and getting adjusted with it, I actually happen to like softer tips now over the medium because I've, I've, I've shot with all of, all of my cues just so I can see like how much of a difference there is between all of them. And I have now uh, come to like softer tips more than I do medium tips. But you might be someone that likes hard tips. You might be someone that likes medium tips. So I, 
you have to be able to figure that out for yourself and not because of someone recommending them to you. Just like if I were to recommend any Q brand, right? It's 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 going to be the same thing or recommend a specified weight uh, that your Q should be. It's it's all going to be personal. And that just takes time for you to be able to figure out. Uh, let's see, who else is in here? Tally of Cali, Nightlife and Dad Life. How's it going, AJ? I see I got another bot in here. Anthony Wisenant, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Happy New Year. Tomorrow is going to be 2022. Chris Habgood, uh, local Texan. How's it going, man? Adrian Lobos, good to see you. And then I, I, I'll just call you Mr. JSP. Why is nine ball played in all the big tournaments like the Moscone Cup and not eight ball? Eight ball to me is much better version of the game. Um, I think my answer is going to be that um, eight ball is slower than nine ball. And so when, when it comes to like televised uh, type of stuff, uh, you'd want it to be a little bit more um, exciting because in eight ball, you can get to a point to where you're just doing a bunch of defensive shots uh, left and right um, until you figure out a way to be able to shoot at the last ball or whatever, which may or may not be able to look good uh, for like a live feed or television or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's nine ball is fast. Um, and that, that, that would probably be the reason why, um, nine ball is preferred um for tournaments and stuff especially especially for tournaments because nine ball is fast um you know if you if you have um a pool tournament uh at a at a, at a business um and you're playing a game that's not rotational pool like the business doesn't want to be there all night trying to finish uh, trying to wait for the for the tournament to end because i've seen tournaments that start at you know six or seven p.m and because they chose a not so good format doesn't end till like 5 a.m. the next morning, all right? So you know that's all well and good for the players that might have won that tournament, but I can imagine what that was like on the players for lasting that long, and of course on the business for having to stay open that long to to allow the tournament to finish. So that would probably be the reason why nine ball is preferred um, over that. <laughs> What's going on, B Stack? That's one of my uh, APA uh, teammates. He always loves to come and troll into my. Uh, my channel uh, with the oddball questions like, where do babies come from? <laughs> the stork. <laughs> uh, Sari Cadel, how's it going? Every, uh, how's it going? Uh, Seth White. And I think that's it. At least until new people pop up. Um, so yeah, let's get things started um, here because I only have a, a limited amount of time and I don't want to waste too much time because I want to have uh, be able to make it to my local pool hall um bef uh and have some time to practice before the uh the tournament tonight so with that being said let's do this if anybody joined last night's live stream you'll know that i did uh something that i thought was pretty cool i, I changed the layout of everything so that way hopefully the stream was more appealing than what you see here which is just the camera looking at little old me. So what I did for reviewing my APA eight ball matches is this. Whee! What do y'all think of this? What in the world? Why is that doing? Oh, actually, I know what that is. Ah, all right. I can fix that right now. I got to change this. That's better. What we were looking at was a, um, a live chat from a test stream that I was doing while I was building um, uh, this this layout. <clears throat> uh, Beast Egg, what tournaments tonight? They have an eight ball blind draw scotch doubles tournament. So you have no idea who your who your t uh, who your partner is going to be. <clears throat> uh, Nathan Mayer, welcome to my stream. Thanks, man. I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the support. But here is my new layout that I've created for reviewing my um, APA 8-ball matches. What do y'all think? It's Like I said, it's very similar uh, to what I had done um, in the uh, the straight pool thing. And there's the thing. Someone, uh, Wayne Berber, you're asking about the innings. I figured um, I am no longer going to track uh, innings because of so much interaction 
that I have to um, do during the live stream. If this was post production to where I can just rewatch uh, certain, uh, you know, each rack over and over again and then accurately count and accurately count the innings, then I would probably do so. But at least here in a live stream, it's it's too much work uh, to try to keep up with. So all I have is the um, the regular score uh, that you see, uh, or what the race is going to be. And then what our scores are going to be, and I think I have to sneeze. All right, so hopefully I didn't blow anybody's ears out. <clears throat> so all we have here is just what the race is going to be and then what the score is uh, throughout the rack. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit less work um, on me. If I actually had a more efficient way of updating uh, things on the screen because I'm still going to try to, you know, show you where I'm hitting at um, on the cue ball. So that's that's a constant interaction uh, that I have to that I have to do uh, on top of you know at least updating scores is easy because whenever the rack is over that's that's easy to do. But then to keep remembering who started this who started the inning who ended the inning like that that was just too much work. And so I wanted to at least try this for now because I know if I ever get back to reviewing nine ball. Because if I can get on a nine ball team, I'm certainly not going to track the innings um, on that because it's just it's just way too much because I have to keep track of counting, um, uh, counting the points uh, for each ball that's made on top of being able to try to um, update the uh, the cue ball diagram to let you know uh, where I'm hitting at on the cue ball. But like I said, this is my new layout. I'm going to create other layouts um, uh, in this uh, as well. Um, and just like the layout that I had in straight pull, I'll have different color schemes and stuff like I'm right now I'm kind of looking at a yellow uh, color scheme for whenever I play the nine ball ghost I'll be looking for a blue color scheme when I'm playing the 10 ball ghost so I'm going to be I'm going to be do, putting in a lot of work and trying to get the trying to get these these live streams a little bit more eye appealing and uh easy, hopefully hopefully easier to follow so I want to do a quick test on something and that is do the scores update like I want them to and they do okay cool so you can see how that you can see how that's going to work. <clears throat> so let's see, what do we got here? You think this layout takes 20 pounds off of me? <laughs> well, I appreciate that. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Sari Cato, you're not a fan of blind draw scotch doubles tournaments. The last thing I want is a partner that can't shoot and doesn't know what they're doing. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to argue that, right? Is who, who 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 would want that? You know, but. I think that, that I think that all makes up for the the if you try to look at the challenging uh, side of things, and that is well, when you have a strong partner, you would think that the simplest thing that you can do is just attack the rack, attack the rack, shoot, 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 because you're just gonna run out. But when you don't have as strong of a partner, or if you have a weak partner, well then, I'm not saying that 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 it's um that you're just guaranteed to lose, you know, it, it's a matter of what can you do for your partner? Because the only thing your, your, your lower skill level partner can hopefully do for you is to be able to make the balls that you set them up for, right? So if your teammate is not as strong as you are, then what do you have to do to be able to help your teammate as much as possible? That's at least the positive spin that I know how to put on a situation like that. I know it's a it's it's a pretty far reach uh, because you can set you you could set your teammates up with straight in shots or whatever, and they would still miss, right? That that that's always going to be the argument. But that's that's at least how I would probably look at it. Um, certainly, when I played blind draw scotch doubles, I don't go in the I don't go in there with the attitude to win. I go in there with the attitude to have fun uh, because not have. There's two things, not having control of who your partner is going to be, and then, of course, not having control of the rack because you always have to rely on your partner, regardless if, you're, if your partner is a strong partner or not. All right, that, that, change, that changes things um, a lot. And so that's the, that's, the, that's the only way I can um, – that's the only way I can explain that. <laughs> Old Man Ferguson, this is OBS. So I'm start I'm st I'm starting to trying to learn um, a few more tricks uh, with OBS to to kind of spruce up uh, my live streams. Uh, so hopefully everybody would be able to um, enjoy it better rather than just uh, looking at just the video. And I used to 
uh, dock myself in the lower right uh, lower right hand corner. I would have my green screen behind me, which every now and again I could still bring the the green screen out and put like some sort of image uh, behind me and stuff. But this is like the intro to me trying to figure out how to create these nice little layouts whenever I do my live stream. So you know, eventually things might move around. I might be able to add some more stuff, remove some stuff. It it just really depends. But this is how it's all going to start, and we're going to see where it goes from here. Yeah, Brandon, right? You play a blind uh, Scotch Doubles tournament, but it's a $5 buy-in, and it's just fun. It takes some pressure off of the game. I mean, that's, an, that's another good way uh, to, to put it as well. So, like I said, not knowing who my opponent might be, or not my opponent, my teammate might be, that's why the only reason why I can just go there is have fun, ring in the new year uh, with my locals and my fellow pool players, and just have a good time. <clears throat> All right, so in this matchup here, um, I believe my opponent is a skill level six. Um, I'm going to have to pull up APA. Let's have a look. And because uh, I see that I have a race to five, and that's not right. <laughs> that can't be right. I don't think my opponent is a seven. So we're going to look. Yeah, I have this wrong. So let's see here. This is... Should be if I do this right. Uh oh, what's not working? Oh, that's not working. There. That should be better. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, this is a yeah, my opponent in this match is a skill level six. So let's try this again. Like I said, in this match here, um, this is an opponent uh that I've actually interviewed on my channel. This is Wayne. Um he is um Good friend of mine loves to play against me. Um, every time our team comes to, uh, every time our teams come to to match up, he always wants to play against me. Um, and uh, I think I I think I have another match of ours, um, the, an older match, and then of course I have an interview that I that I had done with him uh, here on my channel. And so this is going to be a race to five four, my five to his four. And like I said, I'm not keeping track of the innings this time, so let's just watch and see how this match goes. And I will try to uh, keep the cue ball diagram. Um, where did my scoreboard go? Well, my, not my scoreboard, my scoreboard program. So you can see that I lost the lag. So Wayne's going to get us to start us off. There we go. All right. Gee whiz, I'm like all over the place today. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Jace, uh, what looks like a coffee table? The pool table? All right, so actually, you know what? Let's get rid of the, let's try to speed some things up and get uh, get rid of the downtime of lagging. Okay, so it looks like Wayne is going to be going uh, for a uh, eight ball break. So he's gonna be hitting the ball that's in the second row. You can see that eight ball comes flying out of the rack. I saw a ball go into the side pocket. Um, what ball was it? So let's see here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six. It must have been a stripe. It must have been the five ball. So I am stripes on this matchup here. Oh, <laughs> so our uh, league, Jace, is played on three and a half by seven foot uh, tables. So this is you know, what we commonly refer to as a bar box. All right, so let's see how Wayne tries to uh, pick apart this rack. Doesn't really have a whole lot that he can work with here. A 
what do y'all think? What do you what do you think he should do here? I mean, he's solids. He's got all those solids tied up there on the left side of our our left side of the rail, and then the one ball just sitting uh so lonely uh, out here at the uh, the bottom half of the table. Yeah, Beastag, this is from the fall 2021. I have uh, four of these uh, that I'm going to be um, working on. Uh, JC, stop asking uh, what city uh, that we're in. If you've been following me um, long enough, you'll know that I don't like to reveal uh, that type of information. Um, it's got nothing to do with, like, I'm some hot stuff uh, uh, or anything like that. It comes from me working for the Department of Defense. I used to hold a top secret uh, security clearance, and I have a, an appreciation for private information remaining private. Uh, so if anybody's in the chat, please do not answer that question um, either. I will at least tell you that this is the central, I live in the central Texas area, and that gives you a wide range of uh, places uh, that I could possibly be in, and that's as, that's as good as, or as close as I'm gonna get. So, I come to the table here. You can see that Wayne accidentally pocketed one of my balls. This shot there was intentional. Caroming or billiarding off of the 12 ball to basically play that combination that I had of the 13 and the nine ball to go into the corner pocket. <clears throat> so, but it doesn't leave me much, right? So all I can do now here with the uh, 12 ball is I think I have some bottom right um, on this. I want the cue ball, I think to hit below the side pocket and then spin back. Oh no, never mind. I actually drew it back far enough. Now we can see that I'm going to have some issues though. Now I did happen to notice that this 13 ball here is actually cuttable to the corner pocket. Even though the 14 and the 13 look pretty darn close, there's actually the 14 is actually just slightly above uh, the 13, giving me just enough room to be able to clip the 13 and possibly go into the corner pocket, which is what I end up trying to do with just a rolling cue ball. You can see, and all I ended up just doing was, was undercutting the ball. But now I own that pocket. So I would have to think in a, in a scenario like this, it's probably to my opponent's best interest to actually hit his three ball and knock my 13 in to open that pocket up for both his two ball, his four ball, and his six ball. But he plays the two ball, comes down table, gets position on the one. That's actually pretty good. But even when he makes this one and if he makes the seven, what's he going to do from here? He's got to probably bank the four or bank the three. He's going to have to do some sort of bank shot. On, uh, on those remaining solids. Looks like we've got some top spin there. Gonna follow the cue ball. Gently follows the cue ball. He has position for the seven in the side. I'm wondering if that was intentional because he could have just rolled the cue ball forward to get position on the uh, seven to go into the corner. See some top spin again. Oh, look at this. Oh, if he had clipped that three and knocked my 13 in, that would have been awesome. But this is the point that I was trying to make uh, to where now that he's gotten to this point, what do you do? Right? So I, I think the only thing I could see is that he has to try to cross bank the three ball um, into the um, upper right corner pocket. Otherwise, this is where, again, you would take the shot to where hit your three and billiard my 13 in, leaving the cue ball close to the um, close to the uh, upper left corner pocket. I don't have a shot at my 15 ball, and the shot on my 14 ball is difficult. I think that was probably the, the, the best choice that um, he could have made there. <clears throat> All right, so let's see here. Looks like I'm shooting the 13. If anything, I bet I'm just allowing the cue ball to roll with a touch of right spin. So that way I can try to get position for the 15 to go into the lower left. Kind of like that. But the cue ball, you can see me tapping the chalk on the table. It's like the cue ball rolls just a little too far and leaves me a freaking thin cut shot. This is the same This was the same problem that I was having um, in my uh, straight pool live stream uh, last night where the cue ball was just rolling just a little too far. And it's not like I want to hit the ball softer. I want to make sure that the um, uh, the cue ball doesn't accidentally roll off course as it's slowly rolling its way towards the um, towards the object ball. All right. Nonetheless, 
Y'all know that I like to do uh, nice uh, thin cut shots. So I think with a rolling cue ball here, I try to cut that 15 ball all the way down to the lower left corner pocket. And look at that. I actually got behind it. So like it, it's, it's not like it was a 90 degree cut. If we go back and look at it again, let me just pause it here. You can see the angle that I have here to where if I wanted to illustrate, like this would be the, the straight line. And why is this not working? Let's close that, bring that back up. Oh, great. So that's at least working. Uh, let's see here. Um, hang on, more technical difficulties. Actually, it's over here. Close that. And then... Sure. All right, I think that's everything. Yeah, that looks like everything. Let's see if this works now. There we go. You can see here, hopefully. I should have all this better prepared before the live stream starts. So if this is my straight line, like this, it's not like this is 90 degrees. Right, it looks more like this is 90 degrees, and that looks like, or or, clo or close to 90 degrees, and that looks like it pretty much what I actually done. That there was more than enough room uh, for me to be able to cut the 15 ball so much to where I can actually, what would appear that I'm cutting behind it when really I'm not. It's just you know understanding uh, the the geometry of you know how far you're actually able to cut a ball. It's actually not really possible to cut a ball 90 degrees due to um, cut and deuce throw you can get pretty uh, pretty darn close to uh, hitting uh, 90 degrees but not 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 quite exact ooh Wayne had some zing on that ball this actually looks really good for for Wayne right here after me missing that stripe he can play the four ball um, looks like with just a center ball center ball hit here and just come off of the rail looks like he's got some top spin though he seems to favor uh, rolling the cue ball just like that. And so if I were him here, I would probably put some top left spin um, on the cue ball and send the cue ball three rails around. Because the one thing I don't want to happen to my cue ball, I would come out like this because I don't want my cue ball to land somewhere right around here. <laughs> Which is exactly what he did. Because now my 14 ball blocks his eight ball. I would definitely want to make sure that I hit this with some pace to make sure that I get somewhere over here just so I can have access to that eight ball. Because now it looks like he's going to have to do some sort of curve shot, um, you know, a slight mass A shot, or maybe even kick at the eight ball. If he kicks at the eight ball, the eight ball should be more than likely going down here towards the lower left corner pocket. He is marking the side pocket, so I'm betting to see that a, a mass A shot is going to, or a curve shot is going to come up here. So let's see how he, let's see how he does this one. Wants to make sure that he lines it up. Let me move this over here so I can see this better. Uh, A-Funk, I'm not going to be doing a uh, uh, straight pull um, again tonight. I'll probably do it in a couple of days, though. Uh, I'm, I'm just anxious to, to – I, I felt like I should have beat my 35 uh, last night, and I, I'm anxious to, to go at it again. So it won't be long before I do it again. Okay, decent attempt. He at least doesn't foul, but unfortunately, there's only two balls left on the table for me. No obstacles in the way. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I should be able to handle this just fine. So it looks like, what do I got here? I'm going for the 14 in the upper right uh, corner pocket. This has got to be a rolling cue ball with a touch of left spin. So I should be coming two rails around, I think, for the uh, 15 in the side, maybe. One, two. Just like that. 
And what is this? This is uh, probably just a little bit of right spin to go two rails around again. You can see sometimes there's there's been a lot of matches where I don't call the eight, I don't mark the eight ball, and sometimes I do. And then usually when I'm just shooting the eight ball, I, I um, hardly ever use any side spin. The only the only time I use side spin is when, is when I want to make sure that the uh, the cue ball doesn't scratch uh, somewhere coming coming off of some rails. So that at least puts me up one to zero. I actually think that uh, should have been Wayne's rack, just a small error uh, coming off that last ball. Now, in this session for the fall 2021, this was a session where I was trying to do nothing but make the eight ball on the break. So you're always going to see me place the cue ball to the uh, our left side of the table. I'm going to be hitting the, uh, the rack. And I think at this point in time, I was still using uh, a little bit of low right because I want the cue ball to draw over the side rail and then spin back and hit the rack again just so I can uh, ensure that that eight ball co hopefully comes out of the rack. See how the cue ball just flung to the side and then came back and uh, hit the rack again? Now, I don't think I made anything, though. Yeah, I guess I didn't make anything. It looks like Wayne wants to take solids, plays the four ball, holds the cue ball there, and has position on the eight. Trying to see where the trouble spots are. We can see that we've got the one ball here being an issue. The three ball is free to go. Might be able to use the three to free up the one. It's going to just roll the six ball in just like that. That's a good shot. I can't tell if he can access enough of the two ball to be able to go into the side pocket or if he would foul by hitting, um, hitting my uh, 12 ball. He does have the five ball. And it looks like he's, is he going to try to use the five ball to break this stuff up? I don't know if he should. If anything, I'd probably just roll the cue ball up to the seven, have the seven come like right about here, and then just leave the cue ball down here at this end of the table. All of my stripes are up here, so when I'm, if I'm down here at this end of the table, possibly hooked by the eight ball, especially if you can get me frozen to the rail, then I I don't have shots because I can't control the cue ball. All, all I could do is just possibly roll the cue ball around. Ooh, what's he going to do here? That was pretty nice. Does it, it, not really any reward uh, for anything since the cue ball, goes, uh, cue ball went this way. So not able to, to deal with this. I have no clue what that uh, could have possibly been, other than now his two ball is freed, his seven ball is in the middle of the table. But now here I come. Let's see. I don't really have a shot. I can possibly try to cut the 14 ball into the upper left corner pocket. I might be able to bank the nine into the cross side pocket. I don't really see anything else that's reasonable. Yeah, so it looks like I'm going for the 14 ball. What do I have on the cue ball? That looks like some low right. Oh, and I end up undercutting the ball. What would I have gotten position for? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Maybe, maybe be able to 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 shoot the 12 ball here into the uh, lower left corner pocket. <clears throat> all right. So all the while, I, I'm just not sure playing that two ball is like the the best thing in the world. Uh, that you can do because now you start to put yourself in the scenario that I always uh, talk about that you shouldn't put yourself in and that is you're clearing off the table which is all great and wonderful because you you appear to be ahead in the rack when you're actually behind that was a great kick by uh, by Wayne there good hit there but now that he's got those two balls uh, the one and the three all locked up with my other stripes and now 
it's not like um, unless I do something drastic that allows him access to the one and the three, he's not going to get access to the seven. All right, this is a bad position uh, to actually be in. And speaking of Wayne, what's going on, man? Be nice to my buddy here. Do not roast him uh, in uh, or myself, like especially when I miss a shot like that. What happened there? This is an example of doing too much. Like, how could I miss something like that? This is an example of doing too much to be able to achieve something. Because let's back up a little bit. If I just make the ball, right, which I can, I would hope everybody can understand, I can clearly make this ball. But if I do, what do I do next? Right, so I actually tried to do too much to create something. Now, maybe, maybe, if anything, if I would have just played the ball, uh, looking at this in retrospect, and the cue ball just stops right here, maybe cut the 11 ball into the corner pocket. Maybe from this angle. But what did you see my cue ball do? You see my cue ball do this because I was trying to get position on these two balls here. So I tried to cheat the pocket, and since I'm hitting the uh, – hitting the uh, what is that? That's the 12 ball. Since I'm hitting the 12 ball so flat – and then I just try to make that millimeter adjustment just to be able to cheat this corner pocket. And with the pace that I put the uh, that I put on the cue ball, it's just too much. It's just too much. Uh, Mark Fee, you're saying draw to the nine and break the one and the ten. You know how powerful I have to hit that just to be able to do it. I mean, it it is an option. And yes, you're right. I don't know why the score didn't update. There we go. That is that is an option uh, to be to be able to do that, but you see how my cue ball drags out to the uh, what would be to our right, and I now have a shot at the one or the the eleven or the fourteen. But again, same exact thing, doing too much when you can just take what you what the table gives you and then just try to create something. <clears throat> Let's see here. But do you see what I mean, though? In this case, uh, for Wayne, though, is that he has nothing since he's he's put himself in this situation here. And since you're here, bud, you can actually hear some of my critiques uh, that I'm giving you here because there was a couple of times where I think you're pocketing balls when you shouldn't be pocketing balls because you have, in this case here, this clutter that you have that you have to deal with. So now here I am. I am going to try to shoot the uh, 11 ball. It looks like I've got some uh, low right um, on the cue ball. Am I going to be able to cut this in? And I undercut that one. And I've made this clutter worse. So even even for <laughs> – this is this is becoming comparable to my uh, performance that I had in straight pool uh, last night. Mediocre uh, eight ball performance here. But uh, so, Wayne, since you're here, in, in this particular rack, you were able to pick off all the balls that you picked off, and then you had a you had a clutter – um, over here, which you managed to, if I remember correctly, you managed to free the seven ball out. Um, but like none of this did you any good because look what's happening. You're having to chase after um, the ball that's at least out in the open because it's not like you're going to blast this clutter open and just leave the table open for me to run. Right. So this is not a really good position for you to be in. And I'm in I'm, I have full advantage of this table, especially since I'm making you kick after the seven, try to come up with something or whatever until mistakes like this happen. And so now here, when I try to make the uh, the nine ball, and then I try to break open the clutter, and I really, really did not want that stripe to fall. That stripe was like a, an insurance ball for me. <clears throat> but now, at least here, same thing with your one ball. Your one ball is currently tied up. So it would not be good for you to make your three or your seven just because you can. If you're able to make them, and develop your one ball that is probably something you should do otherwise you should take opportunities to be able to set them up now since i broke it out for you which is usually something that you don't want to rely on you don't want you you don't want to rely on your opponent doing something for you because you're not in control of the rack if you're doing that now, maybe at certain skill levels, that might be an okay strategy uh, to actually use. You can see a nice back cut shot there on the 10 ball. Am I going to be able to finish this? I don't really see an issue. Let's see here. 13 will go into the upper right corner pocket. I probably have a touch of left spin um, on the cue ball. 
come down for the 14. <laughs> you see me shake my head like, oh, I hit that just a little too soft. So am I going to try to cut the 14? I am going to try to cut the 14 into the upper right corner pocket. And since I'm bridged over a ball, more than likely I do not have side spin um, on the cue ball. I'm just going to try to purely cut this in. And I purely mess that up. <laughs> Got position on the 12, though. But what does it matter if I miss? <clears throat> uh danks 9000 you're saying the eight ball in the uh in the side break never works all it does is cluster the balls on the side that you broke from as a higher uh level player you sh uh you should know it's better to break uh head on to run out more i will show you some racks where your statement is actually false so uh stay tuned All right, so Wayne comes to the table. Yeah, Mark V. I mean, it happens. I mean, I, I can't, I can't play, you know, uh, top tier or APA seven level tier um, uh, all the time. Everybody, everybody has their off night. All depends on the the layout of the table. Like this shot that I'm about to do here. I can either try to go for the combination. And that's why when I was going to, like, if I was going to review this uh, separately, this was literally going to be titled uh, something to the effect of, like, keep it simple. Because I'm trying to do more complex stuff uh, in, this, in this matchup here than I should have. I should have just kept it more simple, like right there. I'm trying to blast that 12 ball in so I can get position on the 14 ball because they were fairly straight in. And it ends up causing me to miss the shot. Just like when we were watching me play straight pull, every time I tried too much to like overthink something to be able to develop something, I either get out of line or I miss the current shot. And I said that plenty of times last night during my live stream to where it's like I'm thinking more about the end result than the current situation that I'm on, which should always be make the ball your your the highest priority should always be make the ball and then the secondary thing would be get position on the next ball <clears throat> let's see here wayne with another opportunity to be able to clean the table up does he play the seven ball into the upper right corner pocket or does he play it into the right side pocket Tries to go to the upper right corner pocket, but just ends up hitting it a little too full and not cutting it enough. <clears throat> so here's a similar cut shot that I had before, except it was a little bit higher up on the table. It's like somewhere over in this area here. My only option is to try to cut the 12 ball into the uh, bottom left corner pocket. I do have a touch of bottom spin and right spin as I'm going to try to zigzag my way back up table. Bump it. There we go. Much would have rather have been somewhere over here because it makes it simple. But I pull out my left-handed shot, and this has got to be with some uh, bottom right spin also to come on uh, where I'm at, basically, to hopefully have a shot at the uh, the eight ball. Gently shoot the 14 ball in, fairly straight in on the eight ball to go into the corner pocket. And I believe this is the same corner pocket that I shot it in from the last rack. There we go. Let's see if this auto updates now. There we go. So currently two to zero. Oh, let's see. I forgot. Cue ball will be this right here. Let's see how this break works out. See, I don't know. Uh, Danks 9000. That doesn't look like a, a very cluttered up, uh, very cluttered up table. 
At least to me, it doesn't. Now, one can argue, well, how many gaps uh, were in the rack that actually caused uh, stuff like this to happen? Now, I will give you, though, that what you're describing does happen, where the side that you're breaking from, you'll see a lot of balls float over to the other side rail and then bounce their way back over to the, um, the other side rail. That is a thing that does happen. But if you can actually tweak around with where exactly you're striking uh, that ball that's in the second row, you can manipulate the results of the rack. And that's usually something that I've been working on a little bit more to where I actually create uh, this type of a spread. And so long as my cue ball execution is actually on par, I can still actually break and run racks uh, with uh, with this uh, type of break here. doesn't always happen, but I also don't get uh, this decent of a spread uh, on every second ball break either. <clears throat> All right, so right now, this is actually looking pretty good for me. Let's see here. There it looks like I'm checking to see what kind of angle I'm going to need to be able to shoot the six ball here into the uh, lower left corner pocket. Uh, what do I got there? Is that uh, a little bit of follow with some left spin? Oh, no, that was right spin. So that means I'm going to be shooting the three. So if anything, I have to be rolling the cue ball with, uh, for the three ball. I want the cue ball to just roll here and then come right out here, hopefully. Uh, so I have that angle on the six. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Let's go back and look at that shot again. I actually have some bottom left because I'm going to zigzag the cue ball down here so I can shoot the six ball um, here into the uh, the side pocket. So this is kind of the, the zigzagging pattern that I wanted last time where I shot the stripe that was up here and I had to shoot it uh, left-handed. And so now, really, I can see that the uh, the eight ball does go here and the eight ball does go here. But if you look at my the natural path of the cue ball, the natural path of the cue ball is going to want to do something like this. So I have to allow it to go. So my, my hope is to be able to land right around here to be in line for the eight ball to go up here into the um, upper left corner pocket. Oh, I, did, I didn't catch the side rail, so now I'm stuck down here. All right, I didn't catch the side rail with the correct amount of spin uh, to be able to do what I wanted, but I do have the shot that I want, which is to play the eight ball here into the upper left corner pocket. Nailed it, and that was a break and run. That puts me up three to zero. See all that eight ball comes loose? And again, look, do you see balls cluttered up on the side? So that, that's pretty much what I'm talking about. Just didn't really like where my cue ball ended up, that's for sure. And look at the eight ball. Like I said, I'm, uh, the, the, the whole point of, of what I say about when you hit the, like, it used to be basically saying, like, if you, if you hit the ball that's in the second row, and if you're on the uh, left side of the table, you're sending the eight ball to the right side pocket. And if you're on the right side of the table, you're sending the eight ball to the left side of the pocket. I don't really like to say that message anymore. All I really like to say is like when you do this, if you do it quote unquote good enough, the eight ball is going to move out of the rack. And at le as long as you're moving the eight ball out of the rack, at least in the APA league, since eight ball on the breaks do count as a win, that is the part that increases your chances of winning strictly off of the break. Because I've at least made that eight ball in all kinds of different pockets, at least from doing uh, the second ball break. So it looks like I gently slow rolled the 12 ball into the uh, the corner pocket. I'm going to have to figure out what to do with this guy right here. That's why I'm looking. You can see I'm over here checking to see, can I shoot this ball past three in between or past the five and go into the left corner pocket? I don't remember if I could or if I couldn't. And it looks like I've got the nine ball here, the 14 ball here, and the 11 ball here. This is going to be my most troublesome ball. Uh, what is that? That looks like a little bit of draw. And some right spin. I got to be getting position for the uh, 11 in the side. 
Yeah, that gesturing right there has to be that I want to get a pos I, I got to get pinpoint position on the nine to shoot into the corner pocket and be able to bump into the 15 ball. So I think here I just have a rolling cue ball. And see, I don't think I got it. I don't think this gives me the right angle. You can see exactly where I'm pointing that the cue ball is going to run into. And does that mean that the, the, the this 15 ball passes the three? Because I can't break it out. I don't have an angle to do so. It's like I have a little bit of draw. I want to make sure that I run into that four ball just like that. You can see I shake my head. I'm not, I'm not too happy about that. So it does look like that I might be able to cut the uh, the ball past the three. Yep. If, I, if I'm doing that, that means I can. The ball is cuttable. The window's probably got to be like so small. Eight ball sitting right over here. Now, if I don't make this shot, Wayne has a huge advantage on this rack. Is this, this is what I talk about all the time. And I'm not putting bottom spin. I'm putting a little bit of top spin. And you can see I overcut the ball because I glanced right off of the three. So now Wayne has a huge advantage over this rack. Um, a um, unexperienced player would look at this and go, Wayne's losing because look how many balls that are on the table. Well, in order for me to be able to shoot my 15 ball, Wayne has to make a mistake that allows me to be able to shoot the 15 ball. As long as he can stay in some sort of control, I'm never going to have a shot at the 15 ball. And I'm not talking about if he just runs out. Because if he can, if he figures that he can't run out, then hopefully he would know to put the cue ball in a position where I do not um, have a shot at the 15 ball. Now, in this position here, it looks like he has to go for the run-up because he's clearing out the upper half of the table. He has no more balls that he's going to be able to use that allows him to keep the cue ball up here to where I'm going to have to play some sort of bank shot on the 15 ball. So this almost looks like do or die. Let's see what he does here. If I had to guess, I would probably play the seven ball. He looks like he's going to play the two. I would probably play the seven ball here and allow my cue ball to come like this to get position on the two. Now he plays the two. Cue ball is going from side to side. Now it looks like he has the one ball that he can play. What's the three ball pattern that he's going to play here? You play the one ball here, and it looks like there's a cut angle, so you have to make sure that you come over to the side rail like this and maybe back out for the six. Oh, he super drew that. <laughs> Look, that still ends up right where still ends up right where <laughs> right where I at least drew the line. So now that means he has to be shooting the six ball in here, and I don't know. Do you stun out to here? I can't, it's it's always hard to tell with the the camera angle that I have. And then shoot the seven over here. That means the eight goes over here, maybe. I don't I don't think you want to risk the cue ball doing this. You know, catch the wrong side of the eight ball. If you hit the eight ball full in the face, then then you're perfect because then your seven ball can go right over here. Oh, it looks like we got a timeout. And heck, you know, it, I, I don't know what's I don't know what's more difficult. It looks like you can shoot the seven. Oh, he does roll the that and see it like that. That almost worked out. And whoa, okay, that was a close one. Now it looks like you can shoot the seven into the side pocket here and just have the cue ball come out over here. And then that means the eight should be going over here. Yeah, just like that. Eight ball in the lower left corner pocket.
Oh, and it wipes its feet on the way in, but Wayne gets on the board. Current score, three to one. Let's have a look at Wayne's break. Okay, pretty decent spread. Cluttered all up there in the middle. What did you make? Uh, let's see. We got one, two, three, four, five, six solids, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stripes. So you are solids. What issues do you have on the table? You're going to shoot the one ball. That looks pretty obvious. I probably would have taken a little bit more time than to just shoot it in. Make sure you knew, make sure you know exactly where you're wanting that cue ball to be for your next shot. I have to believe you were trying to get position maybe on the five ball, but you could, you've also clearly could have gotten position on the seven ball uh, as well. I think you might, I think you might've rushed that one. Oh, nice six, seven combination though. Holy cow. Let's see, that allows you to play the six down here into the lower left corner pocket. With the rolling cue ball, you can get position here on your five. It'll probably be a back cut angle on the five. I don't think you can just get it to nicely stop unless you do that. But that doesn't look like it helped. Do you now have to play a two five combo? And then what are we doing with this guy? Nice 2-5 combo. You might be able to get position on him here for the upper right corner pocket from this position. You're going to have to bump my 12 out of the way, though, because it looks like you're hitting my 12 no matter what. This is looking pretty good, Wayne. Draw, though. Hmm. Not sure I agree with the draw decision. I think I would have tried to possibly push through my 12, and I want to try to land in this window here for the 4 to go into the upper right corner. That's, of course, if unless the 14 ball blocks it too much. Are we going to be trying to cross bank the 4 ball into the side pocket? 8 ball makes that pocket a little bit bigger. Oh, nice try. Nice try. Do we get an APA? We do not. <laughs> Nice try on that one. All right, but unfortunately, when you do when you do a miss like that, we're, you, you just put yourself in the position I was in last rack. So let's see if I can run the table um, after after your uh, run out mistake. Play the ball into the side pocket. Looks like I have position on the twelve. What am I gonna do from the twelve? That looks like a little bit of low left. What am I doing? Pulling it out back to the center of the table. Very dominant position uh, to be in. This looks like more low left. Am I playing the eight in the side or am I going to be playing the eight in the lower left corner? 14 ball looks like it's going to be next. I'll probably just have a rolling cue ball so I can play the 15 next right after that. And then probably with another rolling cue ball. Nope, that actually looks a little bit of stun probably with some left spin. Is this two rail position with low left? That is two rail position. That looks like a rolling cue ball. Go from one side rail to the other. Eight ball in the lower left corner pocket. Okay, so I didn't bother. because like I, When I saw that I shot the ball that was down here, I thought maybe I could have used that as a setup ball for the eight to maybe go in the side pocket. But I guess I didn't like the cut angle uh, going into the side pocket. So I ran this route instead. And that puts me on the hill.
Okay, so there is at least a bit of what Danks was uh, Danks 9000 was talking about because now I do have a bit of a clutter uh, that's pushed over to the uh, left side rail when balls went one way and then came back over another. So like I said, it is a thing that does happen. Let's see here. What did I make on the break? I wasn't paying attention to that. Uh, it looks like it's an open table. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, yeah, it's an open table. <clears throat> Let's see here. Oh, that's right. I remember this. Again, an example of doing too much to try to create something. Watch what I do here. Everybody's, everybody's going to be like, what the heck was he trying to do? If we go back and look, what I'm trying to do here is, one, I want to claim solids, clearly, since I uh, shot the, uh, the seven ball. But what I was trying to do was to be able to combo the seven into the two and make the two. But then you also see that at, um, I'm putting a little bit of stun on the cue ball because I'm trying to make sure that I can slightly cut the seven into the two and then be able to break my six out. Because if I accomplish all of that, because the six ball was going to be the, um, the only trouble ball I was going to have. So again, trying to do too much uh, too soon could be similar to the straight pool strategy to where like maybe I should have tried to do this at a later time rather than right away. But because of all of that nonsense, again, I end up missing the task at hand, which is to play the 2-7 combination. Because if I was just going to play the 2-7 combination and not worry about anything else, I wouldn't be hitting it that hard. But because I know of how full I'm hitting the 7 ball, I know to get it over to hit that 6 loose, because now the 6 is loose, I got to put some pace behind that ball. And that's why I hit that hard. Normally, you would hardly ever, hardly ever see me hit a ball that hard. But because I missed uh, a shot after uh, the break and it was an open table, the table is still open. So Wayne likes stripes. Bumps the nine into the side pocket. Looks like he has position for the 11. The 15 looks like it's going to have to go to the left side pocket. I can't tell if the 14 ball passes the four to go into the upper right corner pocket. Wayne's playing a rolling cue ball here. Oh, he gets past the 15 to go to the 14 in the opposite side, but he's too far um, past the shot line of the 14 ball to where now he can't even get position on the 15 ball to go into the uh, the left side pocket. Because watch, his cue ball is going to come down and give him position for the 13. Unless he overrolls it like that. <laughs> Whoops. Still makeable. He could still try to cut it into the upper right corner pocket, but he's going to have to really control his cue ball if he's, if he's going to want to have access to his uh, 15 ball. Because I don't think the 15 ball goes in the lower left uh, past my three ball. Oh, nice try. Nice try. Yeah, we can see that when you, when you drop your stick on the table like that, you can, t you can tell when the frustration really starts to set in after that. All right, so let's see here. What do I got? I got the six in the corner. It looks like I'm drawing the cue ball. Come down to the three. This is probably with, what, some low right? Come back towards the middle of the table. Kind of like that. Got to be a bit of a stop shot here on the four, I would think, unless there's too much of an angle. Stop shot on the four. Seven in the corner, two in the corner, eight most likely to go down here in the bottom right. This looks like some top left, maybe? Nope, just top spin as I just rolled this in. This will be with some right spin. I know that. Or, no, never mind. 
Left spin, bottom left. Yeah, to get fairly, I thought I would have gone the the two slash three rail route, uh, high inside three railer to get to get the same exact thing, but I decided to go with the low left shot. I'm gonna play the eight ball into the lower right corner pocket. Should be for the win, and it is. Okay, so end up pulling that one off five to one, and the only thing uh, that I know that should be a lesson to myself as well as anybody that was watching, because I am uh, not going to disagree that that was. Um, a poor performance by both of us. Um, Wayne had at least a couple of opportunities where he could have taken the rack, uh, but he just missed uh, like his last remaining ball. And then you saw plenty of times where I was trying to do too much uh, with the cue ball in order to create um, a run out. And that's, that's usually how I like to try to play eight ball because I just want to be able to see if I can just always kind of run the table when if I were playing in um, bigger tournaments, I do tend to play a little bit more conservative, a little bit more cautious, um, and try to make sure that I develop balls and stuff rather than trying to always try to just run out. Uh, so if I actually played that way here uh, in my local league, I would actually have much higher inning uh, matches rather than always trying to run, 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 run. Um, I've got plenty of older matches um, on my um, uh, on my channel where I'm able to finish off in like four innings, five innings, six or seven. But every once in a while, I can get into the double digits uh, when it comes to – well, I don't think I ever get into the double digits uh, on, on a single – it'll be rare if I ever get into the double digits of innings on a single rack, though it does happen, especially uh, when, when uh, me and my opponent are just trading safeties uh, left and right. But that would be the the best thing that um, that I can advise. Um, uh, so Wayne, if you saw um, on this here, uh, I think it would be best that um, if you can identify that you're not going to be able to run the table specifically because you have clutters uh, that you currently just do not know um, how you're going to be able to develop them, then it doesn't really do you any good to be able to um, make the balls that you're able to make and then hope that I end up opening uh, the, the the clutter for you so that way you can have access to your to your last remaining balls. Uh, so sometimes that could be an okay strategy to deal with, but in my opinion, that just means that you do not have control of the rack and you always want to try to get control of the rack, especially when you don't have it. So it would probably be best to maneuver the balls that you can access to create break balls to where you can make them and then break the clutter out at the same time. And then of course, have other balls that are not in trouble to where if you do break out the clutter and you don't have a shot, then hopefully the other balls that you left alone will serve as good backup shots. Uh, that's at least um, uh, uh, an, an advice that I've been repeated, uh, repeating uh, over and over again on a lot of my matches where my opponents would run the table on me but not finish the table, which ends up uh, most of the time causing them to lose the rack. Now. Let's go back to here. We can chit chat for a bit while I set up the next match. And let me see, make sure I know who my opponent is for the for the next match. When did I play? I'm not sure on this one. All right. At any rate, <clears throat> let's see. What do we got here in the chat? Oh, Wayne, I certainly do appreciate that, man. And it's always a pleasure to play. We clearly know that you can shoot, right? You can shoot and you can make balls. So most of the time, it's going to be uh, how you strategically uh, play the game. That's going to be the thing that you work on the most um, is the strategy uh, that you apply to whatever uh, rack that you're uh, um, in. And obviously, including uh, your opponent to see what type of an opponent uh, that you're actually going to be playing against.
this is weird. I can't find this particular match. Where is this match from? For the next match that I'm referring to. Let's see here. Is it this one? Oh, okay. I think I think I found it. All right, what do we got going on here? <clears throat> let's see. Let's scroll up a little bit and see what kind of opinions people might have. I'm always interested in uh, constructive criticism. Okay, see some nice back and forth about uh, whether or not uh, a six should be able to to have a timeout. Um, you get, I mean, I, I have to agree with uh, Mark Lee. Uh, that you know a six is not at the top of the ladder. Uh, so is um, if there if if there is quote unquote um, a better player on your team that's a higher skill level than you, then I mean certainly that there there's going to be things that uh, a level seven will see that a six might not see. Uh, so to be able to get the um, uh, uh, the timeout advice, I mean that's a thing. And that would be that would be no different um, than like I don't know if you were to play um, you know Scotch doubles and you're you're allowed to have like one timeout uh, per rack in Scotch doubles, but if you guys are um, equal in skill level, you're going to be telling each other you know different tips and advice uh, on on what you would what you would do, right? And so could, would the argument stand there? Uh, that because you're of the same skill level, uh, should you should your should your teammate be telling you what to do when you guys would do the the same exact thing? I mean, it's always good to have at least a different perspective because at least when when I give timeouts uh, to my players, I don't tell them what to do. That's something that I used to do back in the day, where it's like I want you to do this. Now what I do when I give timeouts is one, I ask them what they're thinking about if they are thinking anything. Um, because if they have an idea of what it is they want to try to do, I will assess what their um, idea is and give them all the pros and cons uh, that I think exist um, in their idea. And then if it doesn't match up with what I think they should do, then I would give them the option that I would uh, suggest. And they now have two options that they can choose. They can choose the original idea that they, uh, that they had, or they can choose my idea that they, um, uh, that they did not know was available. And so they're free. They're free to choose um, at that point. Ice cold Tristan, happy New Year from South Africa. Are you are you the same uh, Tristan plays uh, that I uh, that I see pop into my uh, live streams every now and again and has commented on uh, some of my videos? Did you change your Did you change your YouTube channel name from Tristan plays to Ice cold Tristan? Yes, it is him. Ha! Welcome, welcome back to my stream. Um, it's got. I think it's it's late. Uh, where you're at, uh, isn't it? Cause you're like a, a good. Uh, well, maybe maybe it's not too late, because I am I am early. Cause you're like a good. Uh, what, six to eight hours ahead of me? Maybe even more. And Mark V, so right there, that kind of proves my point. Sk same skill level doesn't mean same skills. I like that. Uh, you have a you you play better safeties, but your partner um, is better at pattern uh, plays, which is actually that's that's a pretty good mix up uh, to have there. Um, I I would think that work that works out pretty good. <clears throat> okay. So not really seeing a whole lot of chatter um, in between. So I think what we're going to go ahead and do is move on to the next match. So let me switch over to this. Whee! Now, here's an opponent that I've played a couple of times on my channel. I think I have like maybe one or two matches uh, with them. Uh, I think at the there, there was a point in time where he was a seven. Uh, but I think he dropped down to a six 
uh, during um, our match here. That's why the race um, hasn't changed. It's it's going to be another 5-4 um, race. Um, and remember, again, this is still during the, uh, the, the time frame where, like I said, all I'm doing is – all I'm trying to do is just eight ball breaks. I want to be able to try to make the eight ball on the break and the rack as soon as possible and then move on uh, to the next one. And then – here in the spring for 2022, when I get my uh, when I get some new matches in, that's when I'll go back to doing a more classic break of hitting the head ball, uh, trying to produce a, a, um, a massive spread and then be able to hopefully uh, break and run the table if I'm able to. But then when I'm on the hill, then I will switch uh, to doing an eight ball break just to try to close the set um, immediately. I always flip flop back and forth uh, between the two uh, for the, the main reason is just to show. Uh, my APA teammates, like, you know, all the pros and cons of, you know, breaking, um, you know, head on into the rack versus doing the eight ball break. And so that way they start to become more familiar with and more comfortable with uh, utilizing those types of break styles. So with a race to five, four, um, again, with this matchup here, let's see how we do. Okay, looks like I won the lag on this one. Okay, so like I said, starting with the uh, the second ball break. Again, this goes with uh, some bottom right spin, I think. Let's watch the cue ball. There, there is a point. There was a point in time to where I started putting nothing but bottom. Maybe, and I don't remember when I started doing that. You can see like my the cue ball is behind the rack, so that's clearly some bottom right spin. But what in the world did I make on the break? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm stripes. And it looks like I have nothing to shoot at but that 14 ball. And it, I guess it looks like I should be able to cut it over there to the side pocket that you saw me gesture. I see I got a lot of bottom spin. I'm going to hit that rail. So what kind of side spin do I have on it? That is, that's bottom right spin. Pulled the cue ball out towards the middle of the table. Am I able to shoot the 11 ball? There I'm checking to see if the 12 ball can pass between the one, and this looks like my 14 ball to go uh, here into the um, bottom corner pocket. That looks like a rolling cue ball. So I must be shooting the 12 next. Or change my mind when I get there. That's a common thing. Or maybe I, maybe I just have an angle that I actually don't want. So it looks like I have a little bit of draw. Probably some right spin. Nope, just draw. And judging by the way I'm I'm looking, I probably wanted position on this guy, but I think my cue ball might have moved enough to where the eight ball blocks me. So does that mean I have to go for the 15 now? Or can I see this ball? Clearly, I can shoot this 15 ball into the upper right corner pocket, but right now I'm trying to figure out how to close the rack out from here. Oh, I guess I can see the 14 ball. What am I going to do with this? Am I drawing it? I did draw it. That was with some, that was with some bottom right in order to be able to do that. So do I have a good enough angle now just to be able to draw off of the 15 ball? I need to land somewhere right here just so I can access the 9 ball. Yeah, kind of like that. And so here, all I should have to do now is just uh, allow the, the cue ball to just roll 
You can see right here, this is where I'm landing, so I can play the eight ball here into the side pocket. So my only concern is this one ball. If this one ball blocks me, then I've, I've ran all the way here for nothing. So I'm pretty sure all I did was just roll the cue ball, probably with just a touch of left spin. Well, pretty close. Pretty close. I said it's been a, it's been a while since I did these matches here, but now you can see I marked the uh, eight ball for the side pocket. And if I make this, I think I start this. Uh, I think I start this set off with a break and run. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I opened the set uh, with a break and run on that one. on forgetting to update the cue ball. Okay, that's a pretty decent break there. Uh, what did I make? One, two, three, four, five. Looks like I made two solids and then one, two, three, four, five, six, and one stripe. So really, I would hope that I run this one out too. Let's see, 13 ball, top spin. Do I have a touch of left? Spin out maybe for the 11 ball in the, in the side pocket? Looks like that's correct. I didn't spin far enough. Does that mean I'm going to shoot it in the corner? Yeah, I think so. I think I have a little bit of draw on this one here. Uh, I, I think I'm shooting that 11 into the top left corner pocket. Oh, and I undercut the ball. So that, that's how you mess up a break and run right there. <laughs> All right, so my opponent gets his first chance at the table at solids. And it doesn't look like he has much to work with. Uh, maybe cut the one ball into the top left corner pocket? Or can he see enough of the seven? Or does the five pass the seven? I can't really tell. The five does pass the seven. Bumps the six ball. Yeah, I think he wanted to maybe bump the, the stripes. Looks like he's got some top spin. He's going to uh, follow up after the seven. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Ooh. Okay. That gives him a shot at the two ball. Uh, does he try to draw the cue ball into the ten? That way it holds position for the one. Yeah, kind of like that. This is looking good for my opponent. What's he going to do with that six ball, though? Okay, just holds the cue ball there. Six ball cuts to the bottom right corner pocket. He can just allow the cue ball to go from side to side and play the eight in the side pocket. Oh, it looks like he overcut it. He overcut the ball. Oh, man. That was a really good run. Hey, Ron, the pool student, thanks for being here, bud. You have yourself a happy new year. All right, so I come back to the table. I thought I might have lost that rack. And you can see this is going to be my issue unless I figure out how to deal with it. Let's see. This looks like some top left spin. Am I going to try to break it out now? That's what I tried. <laughs> That's what I tried. <laughs> I tried to break it up. Couldn't do it. Uh, so it looks like I'm going to play safe. So this is kind of what I was talking about uh, from the, the last match here. I can identify that I'm not going to be able to finish the table. So I tried to play a defensive shot. I don't remember, in, in, judging by the way I reacted uh, from uh, walking away there, I don't think I pushed the cue ball far enough to where the 14 ball perfectly blocks uh, the cue ball. So I, I, I just, uh, I don't know if my opponent, I, I don't think my opponent could shoot straight at it and, and make it or can he. Like, 
The camera angle doesn't makes it look like he can't. He should be able to hit it. Oh, he could shoot straight at it. Oh, goodness gracious. So I got off a little lucky there. But like I said, since I identified that there was no way I was going to run the rack without doing some sort of a hero shot. So the idea was obviously to be able to push the 11 ball into the short rail and have my cue ball hide behind the 14 ball to where my opponent has to kick at his six ball. And if he kicks unsuccessfully, I get ball in hand with four balls wide out in the open. So when we look at that side pocket shot there, that's just a rolling cue ball. And it looks like I'm going to be shooting the 14 ball next. It's like I'm stunning the cue ball. What am I doing here? Okay, stun the cue ball to get position on the 11. That must mean maybe what? The 12 ball is going to, or the, the 8 ball is going to go here into the upper right corner pocket. What am I doing? That looks like uh, top left. Oh, top right. I, I'm, I'm trying to get position for the eight in the side pocket. <laughs> roll. Roll some more. Roll some more. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm going to try to cut the eight ball in the side pocket. This is a rather thin cut shot, but hopefully everybody should know that I'm, I'm comfortable taking really thin cut shots. I shouldn't have to shoot them, but I'm comfortable taking them. There we go. Eight in the side pocket. That puts me up two to zero. Oh, look at the eight. Look at the eight. Eight on the break. Got a break and run along with the eight on the break. How did they get there? Let's look at it one more time. Look how much attention I put into my break. You see me just sitting there for the longest time. So it looks like it's heading towards the side pocket and then gets bumped by the stripe to be able to go into the uh, upper corner pocket. So I can't, couldn't really tell if it was actually going to fall into the right side pocket if it had enough pace to do so. But then when another ball comes and kicks it in there, I get a little lucky and it falls in the upper right corner pocket. So instant win there. Now, watch, like I said, watch how much attention I put into my break when I, when I get down. Look how much time I'm putting into this break. I want to make sure that I contact that ball that's in the second row just right to get a spread like this in case I make a ball. But I broke dry on this one. What's my opponent going to do? Looks like he wants stripes. Ooh, nice little draw stroke there. That gives him the 15 in the side, it looks like. He can probably bump into his 12. That way we know it'll go past the 9 ball. I wonder if that's what he was trying to do, or did he just want position on the on the eleven? Hmm. I mean, that was a that was a good shot. the The only thing I would have to say that I um that I I'm I'm not too fond of is how he's going from one end of the table to the other. Right, so we just saw that he was at the um, foot end of the table uh, shooting some balls. Now he's come down to the head end of the table. Now he's about to return back to the fo uh, foot end of the table, only to return back to the head end of the table to be able to uh, shoot the eight ball, hopefully.
Oh, and he misses the 13 ball. Uh, Mark V looks like a push shot. Which which shot looked like a push shot? We can go back and look at it. Let's see. It looks like I'm playing the five in the lower right. Looks like I've just got a rolling cue ball. That gives me automatic position for the three. Down the rail uh, to the bottom left. All right, so let's go back and look. Down the rail to the... Oh, that must be this shot. A Ten ball shot. Let's have a look. Uh... Yeah, I think I might have to agree with you on that one. That cue ball instantly starts to roll. There's no hesitation. Um, yeah, I pro in retrospect, I probably would have to. Um, I probably would have to agree with you on that one um and again this being back uh um a session uh, a session ago um not i must have not been paying enough attention to um want to call someone to come and to come and watch it uh because if if someone's not watching the shot i can't i can't say anything because it's going to it's going to be the shooter's call he clearly thinks it was a good hit so that's why he uh continues to shoot um after that uh, but looking uh, at the replay and judging by how the cue ball was reacting, I think I would have to agree with you that that was probably um, a double hit um, on the cue ball and there and therefore actually would be a foul. Uh, so returning back to my position here, this is where I shot the five ball into the uh, lower right corner pocket. The cue ball just rolls. It gives me natural position for the um, uh, three ball. So I would have to think that I'm not going to do anything with the cue ball and just get position on the two. So more than likely, just another rolling cue ball. Andrew L., happy birthday. Thanks for being here on the stream. And I see that I've got 84 of y'all in here. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Always appreciative to have people taking the time out of their day uh, to come spend with me when I do stuff like this. <clears throat> You can see it looks like I'm waiting uh, for someone uh, on the table next to me to shoot. Let's fast forward a bit. There we go. So what we just saw, it looks like I wanted to know where the position of the cue ball needed to be to get position on the seven. So still just using a rolling cue ball to come out here towards the middle of the table. So that way I can shoot the seven ball, which opens the six ball up. Now it looks like I've got uh, bottom left. Does that mean I'm getting position on the one ball that's on the opposite side of the table? Or am I trying to get position on the four? Nope, getting position on the one. Don't really like that I got really flat on the one ball. And I can't see what that looks like bottom. I can't see what type of spin I have on the cue ball. That had to have been a little bit of a bottom right. That gives me position for the two. So I can probably play this with uh, a touch of right spin and some top spin to come behind the eight ball to have position on the six, which means the four ball has to be the last ball that I'm going to shoot at. Because now I can play this probably with some stun left, come out to about right here. If I got straight in on the four ball, then I can just draw the cue ball back to play the eight ball into the side or into the same corner pocket. If I get some sort of an angle, then I could probably play position for the eight to go here into the side pocket. So there's the stun left. Or do I just roll forward and play the eight in the upper left? It looks like I've got draw. So I think the eight ball goes into the same pocket, just like that. Go and grab my marker. John Hill, how's it going? Thanks for stopping by the stream. We're, we're, you're currently looking at my, my second of four matches that I'm going to review from the fall 2021 uh, session of APA. So, and there's that. Does that put me on the hill? Or have I jumped the gun? Broken ran the first rack, won the second one, eight ball broke 
broke on the third one, and then just won this one. So yeah, so I think that puts me on the hill. Yeesh. Not so much of a not so much of a spread on that break there. <clears throat> well, thank you, John. I do appreciate that. You actually missed on the uh um on the first matchup there uh that I that I reviewed my performance in that match just wasn't the greatest. Lots of ma uh, lots of misses on that one, and uh, the lesson that I tried to portray off of that was to be able to, was the idea of doing too much to be able to try to create something. Uh, so like when when there's not a whole lot that you can do uh, with your cue ball to be able to get position on the next ball, you try to do a little ex something extra, um, and by doing so, you end up missing the current shot uh, that you that you're that you're trying to take, which is what happened to me a lot on the uh, on the last match there. So my opponent takes off and starts with solids. Now, right here, I'm actually thinking about shooting the four ball, uh, given this position here, because when I look at the two ball, I, I can't tell if the two ball goes. But if it did, I would want to play the four ball into the corner pocket and have the cue ball come over here and bump the 10 out of the way. So that way, hopefully I can shoot the two ball next. That's at least what I'm thinking. And if I can't shoot the two ball, then maybe I can just shoot my seven or even the six so long as the, the ten ball doesn't get in the way. Looks like my opponent might be looking at it right now unless he changes his mind. So, yeah, it looks like he's going to go for the five ball. Five ball should be able to at least set him up for the three. I think that looks like the natural roll that it's going to happen just like this. So this is a good shot. Now, the question becomes is, does he get position on the six here? Looks like he's got some left spin on the cue ball. I think that's what he's trying to do. Yep, that's to get position on the six. Okay. Now I'm really starting to wonder about that two ball, though. Definitely got to have some left spin on this cue ball for, for this shot here. Six goes into the upper right corner pocket. Oh, and he overcut it, though. Okay, so that allows me to come to the table. And I've got a bit of a mess to work with. I don't want to risk shooting the 11 ball uh, to the upper left corner pocket, especially from the angle that I'm at, because then I'm more than likely going to scratch in the side pocket. Now, here in retrospect, I can look and see that I probably should have just played my cue ball into the 12 and uh, banked the 12 and tried to leave the cue ball like right around here maybe. I can't tell if he'd be able to see the four ball. But even if he could see the four ball, he loses access from being able to um, play his two. I end up opening his two for him by cutting that ball in. That was probably not the smartest choice I could have made on that uh, on this inning here. Let's see here. Uh, Bob Henson, you're asking if the shot down the rail was a foul. Uh, going back and looking at it, um, I, I do believe it was probably a double hit, uh, just judging by the reaction of the cue ball. But I wasn't, uh, somebody wasn't watching the shot at the time, so there was nothing I could do um, at that point. All right, so this looks like, what am I doing? Ooh, okay. So that must clearly mean that the nine ball did not pass by the two to go here into the corner pocket. Instead, I end up playing the nine ball off of the four and having it carom into the corner pocket. It didn't look like my cue ball went anywhere, so that had to be basically a stop shot. And then what, what's the setup that I have after that? Oh, the cue ball kind of rolls a little bit. Okay, that gives me position on the 14 ball. I think my 10 ball can go into the corner pocket, and this is going to be a trouble spot. And then I still have my 
and I still have my 12 ball down here. So what do I do here? Yeah, I'm I'm looking at these two balls here because I, I got to figure out what I'm going to do with here. Like I can obviously get some sort of position where I can shoot the 13, but then what in the world am I going to do with the 11 ball? Right, there's hardly any any position that I can play that uh, that's going to allow me to shoot at them or shoot at it. I'm pretty sure I did not mean to do that. <laughs> I think it looks like I was trying to get position on the 10 ball. So that was a little bit of a draw shot. And I'm I'm certain that that, that was probably uh, to try to get position on the, the 10 ball. Maybe even the 12. Rack Accoutrements, welcome back to the stream, bud, and happy new year. So here I'm pretty sure I'm just going to give the table back to my opponent. Uh, unless I am trying to bank that into the cross corner. Oh, yeah, I do play a safety. So all I can do there is just try to create some distance. Doesn't look like he can see his two ball. Doesn't look like he can see his six ball. He can see his four ball. And it looks like the four will not scratch if he tries to cut this into the corner. Let's see here. Oh, can he see his two? Oh, he's looking at the seven. Oh, I'm not even paying attention. He's looking at the seven. Nice little carom off of the six. So this doesn't look good for me. So I think at the very least, my so-called safety um, is, is a, a distance uh, safety shot. I tried to leave the cue ball as far away from any of his object balls as possible. And if he comes with it and makes it, then he deserves it. Ooh, did he get far enough? He, he, he's bowing his head down. I don't think he got far enough. Oh, he did get far enough. I wonder why he bowed his head down like that. It, 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 it seems like a gesture to where it's like he didn't he didn't get the position that he was looking for. So eight in the upper uh, upper right corner pocket or upper left corner pocket, and this puts him on the board. There we go. All right. Okay. It's like he's going for a second ball break as well, but he does it from the right side of the table. Let's see if all the balls go to the left and then come back over to the right. Not so much. Not so much. Pretty decent spread. Didn't look like he made anything, though. Let's see here. Uh, Lash, uh, Lance Fishing Fiend, you've been watching a lot of my videos and you're trying to go from a five to a six. I mean, you gotta, you gotta put in the table time, right? You, you can watch all my videos uh, that you want, but unless you take what you watch off of my videos or anybody's videos uh, for that matter and don't put in the table time, you know, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna take more time than you think uh, to be able to go from five to six, but it's certainly achievable. It's certainly achievable. Whoops. Looks like I tried to slow roll the six ball to go past uh, the five ball. I just end up clipping that five ball. So even though I wanted solids, my opponent takes it from me. And that's just rude. And it also looks really good why my opponent would want solids. There's, there's no issue. There's no issue with solids. Look at all the issues Stripes has, especially with that three ball clutter. Now that's interesting. I mean, it worked out. Three goes in the corner. You just roll this in for position on the four. 
Here you can just cut the four on the side and get position for the two. Oh, did that ball skid? I think it did. I think it did. Can y'all can y'all see that well enough? I think the cue ball and the four ball skid apart. And and what that means is that right at the point of contact, yeah, I, I think it did. Right at the point of contact between the cue ball and the four ball, somewhere on the cue ball, most likely, is some chalk debris. And if that ever happens, then th there's going to be too much friction between the cue ball and the object ball, and you're actually going to throw the uh, throw the object ball a whole lot more than you intended. And you can actually see. Let's try to watch it one more time. You can actually see the the um, the four ball kind of backspin for a second, and then and then start to roll forward. And that's actually the skid effect that happens, and can and can be um, obviously really detrimental uh, to to your shot. As I, th I, 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 it seemed like he hit that uh, good enough, but because he hit it with so slow of a pace, and the cue ball is revolving around as it gets towards the, um, as it gets towards the object ball at that wrong pivotal moment, as the cue ball is spinning and it makes contact, there's just that little chalk debris um, on the, um, on the, uh, on the cue ball that comes right there at the point of contact and causes that to happen. All right, so let's see here. It looks like I saw that I was going to try to carom the 10 ball off of the four uh, to be able to break out that clutter there, and I was unsuccessful. Let's see here. He's going to cut the seven into the top left. He is successful. Shoot this in probably with a touch of left spin. Come in between all of my stripes to be able to have a shot at the four ball just like that. Does the eight ball go in the uh, upper left corner pocket past the 15? Ooh. Never mind. Eight ball side pocket. <laughs> okay. Nice shot there. Nicely done. Four to two. Okay, that looks like a dry break. And this looks like another instance where solids look to be the best set to choose. I don't really see an issue with solids. Uh, Steve Cove, you're asking what is my pocket marker? Um, at the time, I was using one of my teammates' uh, pocket markers, which is a little uh, figurine of Alvin the Chipmunk. Typically, I would just like grab my phone or something and uh mark the mark the pocket with that so trevor you're saying that he seems to get a lot of clusters on his breaking side and that's what i was showing you um from before like even even on uh my the the last match in this match it it's you know you can either argue it that you know how many gaps are in the rack uh, that basically cause different types of spreads uh, to occur or the hit on the second ball because I've 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 shown to where like there were certain hits that you can actually do to where like there's just this nice spread uh, to where you can break and run the rack with um, I actually remember seeing an old BCA teammate of mine um, do that repeatedly 
like there was no issue. And I actually had to ask him, I was like, what are you doing? That's because I'm I'm used to seeing balls go from one side and track over to the other. But every time he would break, the balls would just like spread out. Like 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 there was like it was nothing. Like it was a head on break. And the only thing I eventually figured out it was just it came down to like how precise you can actually hit that second ball. Am I running the table here while I'm blab uh, blabbing on? What am I going to do with that 11? I'm going to have to think so, Trevor, that it, it does have to, it, a lot of it has to do with where exactly you contact that second ball. And that's why you see me when I'm breaking the second ball, I spend a lot of time making sure that my cue ball is lined up exactly where I want it to be lined up before I strike. That looks like I just rolled the ball in. I'm going to be taking this long shot here. So I have to be putting follow on this one so that way I can shoot the 10 ball into the side pocket. Just like that. And then I'm more than likely going to follow again and make sure that I follow the cue ball to get past the three. There I'm glancing to see like how much room do I have past the three uh, so that way I don't have too thin of a cut shot um, on the eight ball. So the eight ball should be going into the uh, upper right corner pocket. This more than likely is going to be some some sort of a stop shot or a stun shot. A little bit of a stun shot, and I'm able to take that match down five to two. So I don't really think there was um, much to talk about on 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 this one here. Nothing spectacular, you know. It's 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 always uh, it's it's usually going to be like the 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 rinse and repeat of understanding the strategies, under um, identifying the trouble balls. Uh, being able to play decent patterns to bl to break the trouble balls out, uh, play different types of strategies. I think the only um, quote unquote cool things that I had happen on this one uh, was the um, the break and run that I started the set off with, and then the eight on the break that I got um, on I think it was rack three. I think it was rack three, um, and that I, I think that uh, equates to what's called a mini slam um, in um, in APA. I don't remember what a grand slam is. I, I like if I would have won five to zero. If I would have won five. If I would have got. If I I won the lag. So if I would have won five to zero with an eight ball break and a break and run, is that considered a grand slam or is a grand slam something that's in um, is that is is that in Masters League where you play both eight ball and nine ball and you get a break and run an eight ball an eight ball break on uh, uh eight ball and then a nine ball break and run with a nine ball um on the break. Uh, maybe that maybe that's what I'm confusing um a grand slam uh with. I don't remember. <laughs> Whew. Okay. Two more matches to go. Let's see here. Let me get the info. On that match. Let's see here. What's everybody's plans uh, for the New Year's? How how are y'all ringing in the New Year's? Going to a party with uh with some friends, uh hanging out at hanging out at a bar. Like I said, I'm I'm working on uh going to my um local pool hall tonight. That's why I want to get this live stream uh done, uh so that way I can um. That way I can um, bring in the new year and play a um, line draw scotch doubles. Kyle Kerr, so a grand slam is eight ball and nine ball. So that that's something that's achieved in the uh, in the Masters League. Okay, because I, I did play like a session or two of Masters League, but then it eventually uh, we we eventually stopped the Masters League here because there 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 isn't enough players um, in my area that's interested um, in the Masters League. Let's 
see here. I'm trying to find the info on the match so I know what the race is. And I don't, because I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. That's why, because I was looking in the wrong place. Okay. So there's that match there. This is the match. So I stand corrected. My opponent was a seven. I know there was a point in time where my opponent was a seven, dropped down to a six, and he, he, he became a seven again. So that was actually a race to five um, on that last match, and I, and I pulled that victory off five to two. All right, now, now I'm sitting here trying to find the, the next one. Okay, so there's the so my opponent is a um, six in the next one. Okay, but let's just take a minute here. Whew. Got my fan running and it's still kind of uh, warm in here. I've got all my computers, lights, and stuff, so it's a little warm in here. <clears throat> it looks like we got a uh, quite a few of y'all that are just staying home. Nothing wrong with doing that. I used to do that plenty of times. Well, certainly, hopefully, uh, 2022 um, is going to be better uh, than 2021. I used to always remember the, the running joke was, if you thought 2020 uh, was bad, wait until 2021 starts drinking. And then, of course, we start dealing with all of the, the nonsense that we've been dealing with, um, you know what, uh, floating around the world. Um, I don't even think I'm allowed to say it um, on YouTube. Uh, so, I mean... Hopefully things uh, really can, like, we've, as far as I can tell, we've gotten as close to being back to normal as, as we currently, uh, as we, as we currently can. But, I mean, I, I hope it doesn't stay like this. Like, I, I hope it gets better. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll just see from, we'll just see from here and see how it goes. Staying home and trying out some 14-1 that you picked up from someone. But that someone happened to be me, Trevor. <laughs> that's awesome if you did too so I, I hope maybe you take some time to maybe record uh some of your some of your attempts you know do something similar to what i'm doing if it's not a if it's not a road to 100 maybe a road to 50 or you know what, what's three racks three racks would be 28 42 right you know just just something something to doc especially something to document document your pro uh, your progress um El elad her uh, Hervath, I hope I'm saying that correctly. You won an APA match last night with an eight on the break. I've done that a couple of times where I've actually finished the set by uh, making uh, the eight on the break, and it it's it's um it's a feel good feeling and a kind of like an awe feeling at the same time to just like uh, knock your opponent out like that, especially especially if your opponent's on the hill, right, and you're playing catch up. And you get all the way to where you get on the hill also, and then you just end it with an eight ball break, right? It's like you could obviously be happy uh, for the for the uh, um, for the victory, but imagine how your opponent must feel to just allow that to happen. Like it's got to be so gut uh, gut wrenching uh, for your opponent. Oh, and you're actually using the the same break strategy that I taught in my uh, videos or the videos that you see here in in, uh, in my APA matches. That's awesome. Like I said, all I could say is that you know when you're using that break strategy, it's just it's just that idea that it it allows you to have the most movement out of the eight ball, which is what increases your chances. There was always a predetermined path about how you can get the eight ball to uh, float towards the side pocket. So if you're breaking from the left, it'll go to the right side pocket. If you're breaking from the right, it goes to the left side pocket. But I, I've seen it more times than not now, uh, especially since we're not using template racks. Uh, you know, we're just using regular racks, you know, the amount of gaps that are in the rack to where it's like that eight ball just kind of goes all over the place. Whereas in if you do a head on break, regardless of how many gaps that are in there, it's still most likely to stay near the center of the table. Every now and again, a ball will like hit a rail and come out and hit the eight ball and knock it towards uh, towards a pocket or at least knock it somewhere else. Uh, but there's there's less movement. Um, on the eight ball from a head-on hit than there is from hitting the uh, the ball that's in the second row. So when I that's why I say to increase your chances at making the eight ball on the break, you hit the ball that's in the second row because the eight ball is almost guaranteed to move. 
And by definition, that is what increases your chances. The chances are still low, uh, but it is a higher chance than if you're just doing a head-on break. Trevor Simpson, I did hear about that, that uh, Miss Betty White um, has passed away. That's some unfortunate news. How old was she? Did she make the hundreds? She died at 99. She did not reach 100. You know, so that's an un it was unfortunate news uh, to hear today um, about the passing of uh, Miss Betty White. You know, God rest her soul. <clears throat> Let's see here. What do we got going on? So 75 of y'all are in here. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We got two more matches uh, that we're going to try to uh, wrap up here. And I can spoil a couple of things on these last two matches. This next match that we're going to watch, I was literally going to title it the worst start I've ever had um, in, AP, in, in an APA match. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But since I don't see um, a whole lot of questions uh, going on right now, let's go ahead and get that set up. So let me double check, make sure that, yep. Okay, so let's do this, this, and this. So in this matchup here, my opponent is a six. I looked it up, and I'm looking it up correctly this time. Last time I was looking at it, in, uh, looking at the wrong uh, stats um, on the web, where I thought my previous opponent was a six. My previous opponent was a seven, so it should have been a race to five. Now in this matchup here, it's a race to five four. Steve Cuff, you're asking, is it better to use a heavy or light cube for breaking? The rack is not going to know whether or not if your cue is heavy or not, and neither is your cue ball. Um, so my answer is a lighter cue is better. A lighter cue is going to allow you to swing your cue faster, and that faster hit is what's going to generate the so-called power that you'd be looking for uh, that you'd want to put into a break shot. Now you can obviously accomplish the same thing with heavier cues, but to me, I just think it's easier done with lighter cues. So like my BK rush uh, that I use um, in my league matches or my BK three that's in my garage that I use on my YouTube videos, those are only 18 ounces. And then I shoot with a 19 and a half uh, ounce cue. So I've seen people, and I actually have a 21 ounce Viking jump break cue that doesn't perform any better slash worse than my BK3. So I, 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 I in my experience with breaking, I have not seen, I, I have not seen enough evidence to say that a heavier cue is more advantageous uh, to your break, whereas at least with a lighter cue, since I'm able to swing that cue a lot faster. Um, I, I, I can, I, I've been able to see that I can generate more power, uh, by using a lighter cue. So that's why I would suggest that. Uh, Texas Titan, you're saying in a lot of my videos, I use the term a rolling cue ball. Can you explain what a rolling cue ball is? Yes. So if you pay close enough attention, uh, to when you strike the cue ball in the center, the cue ball doesn't immediately start rolling. It actually slides um, across the table six inches, sometimes a foot, uh, depending upon how hard or soft that you hit the, uh, the cue ball. Um, and then after it gets done sliding and the friction uh, of the table grabs the cue ball, then the cue ball starts rolling. Um, and then, of course, if you use topspin, then the cue ball immediately starts to roll forward uh, right after impact. And if you use bottom spin, then the cue ball rolls backwards slides and then starts to roll forward so you've got three states that the cue ball can actually go um, in on the vertical axis um, of the cue ball and so when i'm referring to a rolling cue ball i'm just i'm not really saying top spin even though by simple definition it is top spin it's but when i say a rolling cue ball actually here's the best way for me to explain it 
when you hear people talk about stun shots, you don't hear them talk about drawing the, you know, hitting this much bottom spin um, on their shots. When they do stun shots, they're about, you know, this far below um, the center of the cue ball because they want the cue ball to gently slide backwards and then slide into the object ball and then stun off at the 90 degree angle. Well, when you do a rolling cue ball, you do the same thing, but on the other side of the vertical of the horizontal axis. And so a rolling cue ball would look something like this, where you're hitting barely just above center, just to kind of create a, a, an automatic rolling cue ball right off contact, but not so much with a top, uh, not so much with a top spin hit. That's what a rolling cue ball actually is. Or at least I hope that answers your question. <laughs> now, like I said, in this matchup here, I am playing up against a skill level six. This is going to be a race to 5-4. So if you thought the first match was bad with the way that I performed, like I said, this one was going to be titled The Worst Start Ever. And let me show you why. So it looks like I won the lag, and that was a horrible lag, by the way. But that's not the reason why. Okay, let's see how the eight ball breaks go on this one. Well, had a bad lag. Start with scratching on the break. Already off to a good start. So scratching on the break means that your opponent has ball in hand uh, behind the head string, and they can only shoot up balls that are above the head string. Just kind of. Fast forward through his uh, thought process here. Looks like he wants to play a combination. He gets the combination. Um, I, I saw the ball kind of flick off of another ball and then finally hit the combo. I don't think that's exactly what he wanted to do, but he at least makes the combo that he intended on making. So he has stripes. I am solids. And this looks like a pretty good layout here. He's definitely going to want to get the 15 ball out of the way so that way the 10 ball can go into the... Um, uh, top left corner pocket. Unless the 10 ball does squeeze past the, the 15 ball. Because if it does, then he's fine. Lots of top spin. Oh, he plays another combo and a good combo at that. Holy cow. Nine in the side. Okay, good shot. 10 in the corner. Am I going to lose off of the break? I don't remember if I won or lost the, the first rack. Ooh. He let that roll just a little too far. This should be doable still. Eight ball in the bottom right corner pocket. Uh-oh. Whoa. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, good Lord. Are you kidding me? You have got to be kidding me. I, I do not remember that. Wow. Oh, geez. I scratch on the break. He runs out, but he makes the eight ball and scratches. And even if he didn't make the eight ball, a scratch on the eight is considered a loss. Wow. If anything, it looks like he had some side spin on his cue ball when the cue ball came off of the rail, and he shouldn't have had any side spin on that cue ball, and it would it would not have scratched. All right, so I'm luckily on rack two. Starts the I start the game off one to zero. And not so pretty break on this one. I made a solid. We saw the four ball fall into the uh, bottom left corner pocket. And it doesn't look like I have a shot. So that looks like I'm trying to bank the five. Into the bottom left, the third I guess the thirteen ball doesn't block the path. Uh 
Oh, and I was just way off. And then look, not only am I way off on the on the bank, I scratch. All right, so scratch on the break, uh, scratch on the opening shot that when I didn't really even have a shot uh, to begin with. Let's see here. So now my opponent has ball in hand anywhere on the table. With stripes. Chris Hapgood, you couldn't have said it any better than that. That's why you need to know where the cue ball is going to go on any type of shot. Okay, looks like he thinks this 13 ball is actually the hardest. He starts that one off with a stop shot. Wonder how he's gonna wonder how he's gonna deal with this particular area. I know the 12 ball goes. That's not an issue. Good shot there. Does, does he does he have a shot? Guess not. He's playing a kick shot. Ooh, almost made that 12 ball. Wow, that was a good attempt. Okay, so I've got a bit of an issue right here, but once I move the uh, one ball out of the way, the six and the seven have access to this pocket, but the two ball might block the... Uh... <laughs> two ball might block seven. <laughs> Look at that one more time. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't mind showing this for 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 my for my own embarrassment. Clearly, I'm supposed to be cutting the uh, the three ball slightly to my right, so that way my cue ball goes off to the left, which is why I allow the cue ball to follow forward because I'm expecting the cue ball to hit the side rail and then come back out. And I don't remember if I just flat out aimed incorrectly or if something I mean, let's just look i don't think i miscued because i'm so close to that 11 ball yeah i just flat out aimed incorrectly like there's there's no other reason uh for for that to possibly for that to possibly happen at all <clears throat> now if i remember correctly i think that's where the the horrible start ends i think i think Now, I didn't necessarily um, agree with uh, that uh, shot as the um, ball in hand uh, opener. I mean, look at look at what we got here. He plays a three ball combination. So if he's going to do this, I think he definitely should have just popped his cue ball a little bit because look where the 10 ball is going. You'd want the 10 ball to roll away from here and then possibly get the 11 ball to go a little bit closer, right? So if anything, since my opponent has ball in hand, I would say that you probably should put the cue ball like right here and then shoot the uh, 12 ball and then push this stuff forward or don't even use the 11 ball. It looks like you can put the cue ball here and just play the combo and that opens up the 11 ball to go here into the uh, the top left corner pocket. I think either one of these options uh, would lay a little bit better than trying to do this three ball combination. But if, like I said, if you're dead set on doing this three ball combination, then you got to at least get these balls to move. You know the 12 ball is going to go in, which means your 10 ball is going to do that. And you need that to happen. You need your 10 ball to come at least out to here, right? Because then hopefully that has enough momentum on the 11 ball to go a little bit more forward. So that way the 11 ball can go into the side pocket um, as well and possibly use that to set up for your 10, then be able to shoot the 15 ball. Because you can see how the 11 ball kind of kind of stops, and you can see exactly where the 10 ball was going to go. So that's that's what I would have suggested to be a little bit different uh, for this one. So it looks like he's going to still try to cut the 11 in the side. Oh, and just barely undercut it. Just barely undercut it. Caught the point and came right back out. 
All right, so this has to be a stop shot, I think. All right, never mind. I just rolled the cue ball. So there's the rolling cue ball uh, that was asked about. I think it was from Texas Titan. Not necessarily a topspin uh, hit like this. This is a topspin hit. I purposely want to make sure that that cue ball gets to the rail. Gives me my shot on the one ball. This should be somewhat of a, a stop shot here. I don't. I, I, I think the two ball is blocking my seven. Maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't, then I'm fine. Yeah, so it doesn't. So I, I thought I said earlier that I thought the two ball blocks the seven, and I guess that it doesn't. So I'm fine here. Looks like here with the two ball, it looks like it's going to be a little bit of a stun with some right spin to get out for a position on the six and probably do the same exact thing, but with left spin this time, uh, except that looks more like a rolling cue ball with left spin. I would have to think the eight ball is going into the lower left corner pocket. And then more than likely, I would probably just roll the roll this ball in. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's see. I saw a question here. I don't know how familiar you are with the APA system, but if the opponent needs one less game, generally he is one skill level uh, lower. That is correct. Uh, that is correct. So, like, um, when you look at two skill level threes, it's a race to it's a race to two. Uh, but if a three plays a two, then it's a race to three two. If a four plays a three, then I think it's a race to three two. If two fours play against each other, it's a race to three. Um, if a five plays a four, I think it's a race to four, three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's see how this break looks. Like I said, that hor I, th I think everything with the horrible start is finally over. I think I start playing decent uh, from here. All right, so let's see here. What do I got on the table? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six stripes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I am stripes. Got the 10 ball here. Have an issue right here with the 13 and 14 that I got to figure out. If I if I have a chance at developing them, it'll have to be with the nine ball going to the uh, upper or upper left corner pocket. There I am looking at the nine ball for the upper left. That's the, Right now, that looks like the only chance I have at breaking out my 13 and 14 ball, which is using the nine ball. Let's see here. This looks like a topspin hit. I mean, the cue ball rolls forward to give me position on the 11, maybe. And so with the, what, some left spin and some draw, get me position on the 12. Oh, never mind. I went, I went for them right then and there. Look at that. <laughs> and I made it worse. <laughs> so that was more bottom left spin than, uh, than I probably indicated. And I'm probably going to try again right here with some, with a lot of bot, with a lot of bottom left spin. Kind of like that. I mean, they're they're better. The the, the two ball really cut cuts me off uh, from being able to from uh, from me being able to do anything uh, with them. Uh, so what do I do here? I think I got. I think I should be done. Um, I think I have to attempt to play some sort of defensive shot. There's 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 nothing for me to. I, I don't see anything for me to aggressively try here. Uh, so it looks like I might be trying to cut the 14 ball into the two, so I can so I can occupy that pocket. A lot of top spins since I'm so close to the rail. Maybe because of the pace at which I hit that ball, maybe I think I was probably trying to hit the 14 ball flat into the two to see if it'll roll past it um, and, and go in. Okay, good shot on the six. That gives position for the four ball. 
but he takes the five instead. I did not advise taking the five. Look how he has to bridge over the seven ball. Should probably at least taking the, the four ball. Good shot on the five, though. Not going to take that away from him. When is he going to come up here and deal with this one ball? He probably should do it now. Shoot the three into the side pocket and have the cue ball stun this way. I don't know if he wants to roll this. And that's why. I mean, it works. He's got plenty of distance uh, between uh, between the two, but I would think I would think the stun shot would be safer. You can hit the rail and kind of bounce out at an angle, be anywhere over here, and you'd be fine. This this to me looked more risky, but it looked like it worked out. The only problem is is that he's pretty flat on the one ball, so I'm not sure what he's going to be able to do uh, to get position on his seven or his four ball. And he just stops it. And that gives him uh, this shot here, a long shot uh, from the four ball. Oh, what a shot, too. Little lucky bounce off of the point to get position here. You can just roll the seven ball into the side pocket here and have the cue ball stop right around here, hopefully for the eight ball into the lower left. Oh, he lets his cue ball loose a little bit. Not a big deal. This should this should still be doable. Nicely done, and my opponent is on the wait. Oh my gosh, is he gonna scratch? No, <laughs> my my opponent is on the board. All right, let's see here. So now my looks like my opponent wants to do more of a head-on break. We've already seen so many breaks now where we're breaking from the side. Now we've got uh, uh, a head-on break more from the middle of the table. Opponent makes the two on the break. It's a fairly decent spread. The only thing I could say about his break, though, is that if we watch his cue ball, we can see his cue ball flings over to the right. So he didn't hit the head ball as square as I think he would have wanted, because if you do that, your cue ball should not be flying off towards the uh, towards the side rails. The <laughs> dusty tables take a picture because I'm racking. I racked in the last in the last two matches. All right, so let's see what what's on the table here. Did my oh it looks like he made two solids on the break. I don't see the I don't see the three ball. So how do you always like that uh, happening uh, in a in a in a in an APA or any match for that matter? You drop multiple balls and you don't have an opening shot because even in BCA, if you have an open table, like after you drop three or four balls, but there's like not a legible or a, a, an easy opening starter shot. So in this case here, my opponent makes two solids on on the break, but doesn't really have any good access to any of the solids on the table. But I I, I guess he's not comfortable shooting the four ball. Because it looks like the four ball um, is accessible from where he's at, but he ends up fouling trying to go out, go, uh, going after the six. So I got two messes that I have to deal with. I have this mess here, which I can use the 11 ball to hit it and open it up. And I certainly have this mess that I have to deal with. And then it looks like this guy. I've got a lot of problems to deal with. Let's see how I try to tackle them. Nine ball can go into the side pocket. Oh, am I going to am I going to break this open because of the angle that I put on the nine? No, nope, change my mind. More of a more of a head on hit. So this is probably just a rolling cue ball. That gives me access to my 12 ball. Probably just a little uh looks like some bottom left spin. What am I trying to do? Gently draw the ball back. All right. I probably did not hit that hard enough. I 
If anything, I'd be willing to bet that I wanted to get the position on the 11 ball so that way I can try to break out my 15. Because now it looks like I might be going for the 10 ball here into the uh, upper right corner pocket. This looks like I'm just rolling the cue ball. Just like that. Oh, at least it looks like I should have a shot at the 13 now to go into the side pocket. That looks like a little bit of draw. What am I doing? Am I straight? Oh, no. Oh, goodness gracious. That had to have been some bottom left. And <laughs> it looks like I might be hooked. We're going to see a curve shot from me. Looks like it. Now, obviously, I can't illustrate a, a curve shot um, on the, the cue ball diagram, but I'm hitting this on the right side of the uh, cue ball. Make a decent hit. Broke out my 15 ball, but then tied up my 11 ball. But uh, the good thing about being in the position that I'm in now is my opponent's four ball. That's what he should be focusing on is figuring out um, how to how to break his four ball out. Like maybe now. So you see how the cue ball is coming back over to uh, the other side of the table. So if he probably would have put a touch of a uh, left spin on the cue ball, he probably could have attempted to break his four ball out right then and there uh mark v you're asking if jumps are allowed in the apa they are allowed in the apa but you must use your shooting cue no jump cues are allowed in the apa you are allowed to have a shooting cue and a breaking cue but you can only use the breaking cue to break and that is it okay good shot on the six so this is not an ideal position for my opponent to be in right if he decides to make the seven what is he going to do with the four ball? Is he just going to open the table up for me? Okay, nice draw stroke on that one there. So he can see the four ball, but what is he going to do? Is he going to try to block the pocket? Yep, that's what he tries to do. Now, the question is going to be is if that 11 ball passes, then he should be in trouble. So it looks like I'm shooting the 15 ball. This is going to be, should be with some stun right to get me positioned for that 10 ball. But yeah, it looks like that 11 ball possibly passes. So here I should just be putting some top spin since I'm so close to the rail. And just make the 10 ball. Probably a touch of right spin as well. And that allows me to just cut the 11 ball in. Uh, this has got to be with some right spin. And I'm shooting it uh, left-handed. Come back up for the 8 ball. The three-piece cue, uh, Texas Titan, I am I am not entirely sure because I know like a lot of the old-fashioned cues um, like have multiple pieces, right? So I I I'd have to check the rules, the the rule book, but like I I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure if you're allowed to change your equipment during a rack so in other words like unless unless it's needed so like it, it, unless it's needed. so like if i was still shooting with a wooden shaft what do i do if I, if my shaft breaks or if my tip breaks off right because then i have then i have to be able to uh change shafts but if oh did you see that i almost made the eight ball on the break uh but if if there's nothing wrong with my shaft other than like if i wanted to change shafts to have a harder tip I don't think you're allowed to do that. 
uh, because then that would be the hack that I would want to use to where like if I had a jump shot, then I would want to change um, shafts on my cues because since predators uh, like to use a lot of unilocks, right? If, if you have one unilock shaft, then it can fit on all the all of the unilock shafts. So if I were to take my BK rush, which has a unilock joint on it and put it on my shooting cue, then it might be a little bit easier for me to jump full cue using that shaft in, instead of the one that I have. So, but the, the old fashioned cues that have three pieces like that, I, I don't think you're allowed to break it down to be able to, to be able to execute a jump shot. Yeah, Dusty Table says you have to shoot with what you start with unless it gets damaged. Like you have to have a legit reason to be able to change your equipment. Uh, Shane Jansen, you can use an extension. I have an extension, uh, for my black four or five. It's very rare that I, uh, use it. Uh, but it does pop up, uh, every now and again, especially on a seven foot table, which is why I said it's, it's rare that I use it, but it's, but it does happen. All right. So I've been blabbing on and missing the, looks like I've been running some stripes here. And it looks like my issue is going to be this ball that I'm now currently addressing, trying to figure out what I'm going to do. It clearly goes over here, but that means my cue ball has to be somewhere over here in order to do that. So is that even possible to do? Because if not, I have to come up with something else. So like, for example, I might be able to shoot the 10 now and spin over here to break this ball out. But if I do that, I have to definitely make sure I get a shot at it. Otherwise, I need to make sure I get a position on either of these two balls. Now, it looks like I'm going to be shooting the 13 ball into that uh, side pocket. I have to be shooting this with some top left. I must be trying to break out the 15 ball. Kind of like that. But I don't think I got it. I might be able to, I might be able to bank it. But it looks like I'm looking at the combo. So an 11-10 combo. Okay, success. Now my 15 ball is really getting cut off. Oh, gee whiz. Am I really going to try to drill this with some bottom left and get underneath it? Yep, that's what I tried. Oh, look at that. And I missed hitting the 15 ball. So this puts me in a position that I really never like to be in. I probably should have not ran as far as I did here. So I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do. Uh, here. Let's see. Am I going to try to bank this into the cross corner? Nope. Uh, so what I was uh, trying to do, judging by what I saw, I've seen this shot come up more than once. How many of y'all have seen this route where you try to bank the ball to go here, right? Let's just say I had the angle, like my cue ball was here, and I had the angle to be able to do that. Let's just say that, like that, that that's the scenario that we're in. But two things end up happening. Two two possible things end up happening. You either bank short, and your ball does this, right? I'm pretty sure people that that has happened to to everybody. That that's probably the most common thing that happens to everybody. But that's kind of hard to to calculate um, and and figure that out. What isn't difficult to calculate because it's rather natural. And that is when you, uh, however many of y'all have seen to where the ball will do this, you bank it to the side rail, you come over here and you bank long on purpose because then it naturally goes over to the side rail and then comes this way for this side pocket. How many of y'all have actually uh, seen that, let alone make attempts at doing that? Because I'm more than certain that's ex that, that had to have been what I was trying to do on this shot here. I just ended up having that double kiss that happened uh, somewhere um, over here. Yeah, you can see how much I drew the ball. 
and like as as I'm trying to get position, I mean, look at the look at the route of the 15 ball. I'm going to play it slowly. So if we watch the route of the 15 ball, now it looks like I was it looks like it was going to miss. Looks like it was heading right there if it would have missed. So because we saw that it hit the rail right about here. So if I'd hit the rail later, that probably would have increased my chances of being able to make it here into the side pocket here. Let alone since I ended up double kissing the ball anyway. But now in the position that I'm in, I have to hope my opponent makes a mistake. So at least my ball is wide out in the open. Woohoo. Soft shot on the four ball. He has position for the five, the one, or the three. I'm willing to bet. I was going to say I was willing to bet he's going to take the five, but it looks like he comes down to take the one instead. Okay, he shoots the one into the corner pocket. Cue balls comes up towards the middle of the table. He now has position for the six. I would imagine you'd want to take the six out now and then just start working your way up to the uh, to the foot end of the table. And the eight ball should go into the side pocket. Shoot the six in. Oh, he undercuts the ball. That's no good. Now, what am I going to do here? I see some bottom left. Well, that was pretty freaking risky uh, of me because what happens if I don't get in this window? I mean, I'm glad that I hit it as hard as I did, I, but I guess I didn't uh, have the angle to be able to use one rail and come up towards the middle of the table to be able, still be able to shoot the eight ball um, into the, uh, the right side pocket. So that puts me on the hill. Here's my last uh, chance at a break. Oh, look at that eight ball just flying around. And then <laughs> one more scratch. One more scratch on the break or uh, for this match. I don't know. There might be another one. All right. So he's going to try to start with solids. And he must have been wanting to break out uh, the four or the five with the way that it, with the way that he shot that ball. But he missed he missed on uh, both opportunities, and now I'm not sure how he's going to break out the um, the four or the five. Maybe maybe he can do it now. Can he cut the one ball thin enough and avoid my nine? That's what he tried. Yeah, look at that. He gets a little bit of APA there. Because he certainly wasn't trying to make the four ball, uh, but in APA, it uh, uh, slop shots do count uh, for anybody that's not familiar with this uh, format. He was trying to make the one ball, but since he makes legal contact on his one ball and another one of his solids happens to drop, even though he missed his intended one ball, he still continues to shoot. But I don't think he wanted the cue ball to stop right on contact the way that he shot there. I'm pretty sure he wanted to draw the cue ball back just a little bit. Because now it looks like he's lining up for a combination. Ooh, good shot on the combo. But what do you do with the five ball? Okay, nice try on the six, but you can see there that shooting the six was probably the opportunity to be able to develop the five ball if he were to attempt to go for the win uh, from here, because it doesn't look like he tried to break out his five ball, so he was trying to get position on the three, but then if he gets position on the three, it looks like he has nothing else more he can do um, after the five. So I come back to the table here, play a drag shot on the... Um, 
on that stripe there give me position on the 13 ball maybe the 10 in the side if i if i could shoot the 10 in the side I, i'm probably going to take it or the 10 in the corner because there's like there's no better opportunity i'm going to have here to be able to have access to the 10 ball Okay, that was with some bottom right spin. So now I don't there's there's really no more issues on the table. This really isn't an issue as far as I can tell because I can just get the 15 ball here or the uh, 11 in the side. There you can see there was done with a bunch of right spin um, on the cue ball. Would have wanted the cue ball to roll out just a little bit farther probably or stop short so I can shoot the 15 ball like I said. But instead I'm, I'm going to come over here and shoot the 9 ball it looks like. Uh, looks like I have some top left spin. Cue ball's going to be coming around two rails. One, two. Almost scratched again. That allows me access to the 14 ball. So the 14 ball will probably come to the short rail and come out here for the 11 in the side. Probably with some left spin again. Kind of like that. And then with some more left spin, I can push to the side rail and kind of just spin away from the 15 ball. Just like this. And then probably this has got to be maybe with some right spin. Yeah, so that way I can shoot the uh, the eight ball into the side pocket, and this would be for the win. Rick James! What did the five fingers say to the face? Uh, Mark V, it is fun maneuvering the cue ball around um, on a smaller table because obviously the um, – there we go. They're um, five to one uh, for the win on that one. Uh, but maneuvering around on a smaller table um, is more difficult because there's just a lot more clutters. Clutters are bound to happen um, on a seven-foot table, whereas the, as the table gets bigger and bigger – and there's more real estate for the balls to roll around on, then there are less clutters. So when you're able to do break and runs, especially eight ball break and runs on a seven foot table, it's it's actually a, a good feat uh, to be able to to be able to do, especially on a consistent basis, considering that you, we, you, we, we can't really predict the rack all that much, especially since we're not using template racks. So a lot of what happens on the initial break is luck. Um, and then after that, you try to have enough skill to be able to uh, deal with whatever the, the break actually gets you. But it is a lot of fun uh, to be able to maneuver around and try to be able to break up clutters, avoid um, running into your opponent's object balls because everything is so close together. But in this matchup here, I was able to take this match down five to one. Like I said, having a really horrible start, you know, scratching on the break. Uh, my, I got lucky and my opponent ran the table and then and then scratched on the eight ball after making the eight ball. And then I scratched on an opening shot. I had a straight in shot um, uh, uh, for a ball to go into the side pocket, and I and I sh and I miss aimed so badly that I ended up scratching on that one. It was just one bad thing after another. Then I finally caught a gear. I had one scratch there um, again at the end, but I started shooting a little bit better um, towards uh, towards the middle and the latter part um, of the set. And I don't know what to um, equate that up to, other than yeah, you know, I mean. I'm human. People who are going to have slow starts with fast finishes, fast uh, fast starts with slow finishes, or just stay uh, consistent um, all the way through. I mean, you know, we always try our best to be able to play the same each and every uh, each and every time, but sometimes that's just not the case. But now, as I get ready to set up the final match. And I can actually say that on this one, I didn't capture, um, I didn't capture the lag um, on the, on the last match. How long have I been streaming? Almost three hours. That's, that's kind of what I predicted um, this was going to be. Um, now, another thing, how does everybody like the, like the new layout? I don't think, I mean, everybody, I, I get the, I get the oohs and the ahs, uh, when, when they, when they first see it, uh, but what does everybody think?
Like, is it is it more eye appealing, or is 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 there just too much happening um, on the screen uh, for that? Uh, like, do, do I need to do I need to like take it down a notch, or or whatever? Or and actually, uh, uh, another good question is, is there anything I should add to it? So I already saw some of the stuff in the live chat where it's like, what am I using? What kind of table are we playing on? You know, all that all that other good stuff. And when I did my live stream last night playing straight pool, I had all that information on the screen already. Um, like uh, what what pool queue am I using and everything else? And I thought about putting it on here. But as you can see, I really have no place to put it um, uh, unless I unless I shrink stuff down a little bit more, which I obviously don't want to make the 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 playing view uh, smaller. Right, because that's that's the most that's the most important part uh, is to be able to see the table and uh, see everything. Now, since I'm starting to use that new layout, I'm probably going to zoom in uh, on the table more now. To to because some people are uh, some some of my teammates, even though they're okay with me uh, uh, showing uh, showing my YouTube videos, I think it kind of just helps them be a little bit more comfortable to where like you only see the player when they're down on the shot versus being able to see them walk around. So. In the spring 22, 22 matches that I'll probably record, I'll probably zoom in a little bit more uh, to where you don't see so much around the table, but the main focus is on the table itself. Now, the only bad part about that is we can't look at forms, right? We're not going to see uh, arm positions or anything like that because the, the the table will end up taking up uh, the majority of the of the viewing window on that one. I think that's going to be the only downfall, but we'll see when, when we get to that point. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, Persistent Wolf Billiard, since you're watching this on your television, smart TVs, uh, uh, the, the live chat is different, uh, even when you're watching on a phone, right? So I'm already showing the live chat in the, uh, on the right side of the screen, but when you're watching on your, on a phone or when you're watching on a television, if you have your phone in portrait mode, at least the live chat will be underneath the video. But once you turn it to landscape, then the the live chat will also float on top of uh, the the actual video, kind of like an overlay. So you basically have um, the live chat in two different places. And since you're watching on your television, on your smart TV, you're probably seeing the same thing. You see the live chat float up on, from the bottom left, and you also see it here on the right. Because remember, the only reason why I have the live chat on the right side of the, of the live stream is so that if I decide to clip out anything from this live stream and make it into a separate video, since I'm engaging with the viewers and stuff like that, uh, when you clip, when I clip out a video, the live chat's not going to be there, right? So if I start answering a question or acknowledging someone in the live chat, the people that are watching this separate video that I clipped out are going to have no context as to what in the world I'm talking about or who I could be talking to. So when they see that the live chat is part of the video, then uh, that at least allows them to be a little bit more informed as to what I could be talking about. <clears throat> Let's see, 22 and Stewart, how's it going, man? I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, it says you do like the zoom as it's because you like you like to see how the other players shoot, and th I mean that's a thing. Like that's 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 a benefit, uh, being able to see like how my feet look, how my arms look, and the same thing for, same thing for the opponents because it's things that um, we can critique. Because I'm not just critiquing myself; I can also critique my opponents um, if they didn't happen to uh, to watch. <clears throat> Let's see here, Texas Titan, do I do coaching? No. <laughs> uh, the only people I coach um, are my APA teammates. Um, I just do not have enough free time uh, during the day to be able to do like actual coaching uh, like that. I am a uh, software developer. That is my occupation. That is my nine to five. Uh, that takes up a lot of my time. Um, and I just do YouTube um, as a hobby. And so between doing YouTube videos, working nine to fives, um, playing um, APA on Wednesdays and I play BCAs on Sundays and then I try to hit tournaments every now and again on the weekends but whenever I'm playing in a, in a, a tournament on the weekend I'm not making YouTube content so I've got very little time that I get to juggle around um, bad enough as it is to try to include coaching uh, somebody I just I just don't have the time for it <clears throat> Steve Cuff do my opponents ever have concerns with uh, me videoing them yes they do 
And so that's why whenever our match is over, I try to go up to them and ask them, do they mind if I turn it into a YouTube video? Um, and if they do, then what I usually end up doing is just reviewing my match for my APA teammates uh, to be able to see. So that way they can see my thought process is how I break down the rack so that way they're able to learn. But if I'm able to post uh, the video on YouTube, then then I get to do this. Um, <clears throat> and then just there are occasions where like I'll just decide not to bring my cameras like that, that, that. That's obviously a thing, right? It's just like sometimes I'm just tired of looking at uh, videos uh, reviewing because I don't just record my videos. I record my teammates videos or my, my teammates matches as well. Because like I said, since I coach them, I also uh, do uh, post reviews of their matches as well to help them understand like what they could have done or what I believe they could have done better in their matches to uh, either contribute to a win if they did happen to lose the match or if they did win, how could they have won sooner? Meaning how, how could they have won in lesser innings or how could they have had more control over the match, All right? So after reviewing so many videos of my own and even my APA teammates and stuff, sometimes I'll just say, I'm not bringing my cameras and 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 we're and we're just gonna play <clears throat> mark v you're saying my layout looks more like a twitch stream I, I i guess i was kind of going uh for that uh for that layout i used to stream on twitch i i mean i i, I do game uh from time to time uh it was a uh, many years ago that i actually tried streaming on twitch i was playing heroes of the storm and I still play Heroes of the Storm. I, I kind of play it as a time killer. Um, when I do have a couple of hours to spare um, and I don't feel like doing anything, I'll get on my computer and start playing and start playing video games. And actually, um, I, I can say that one of my latest things that I've been getting into is playing uh, Sudoku, um, if anybody's uh, familiar with that, um, where you have to be able to place numbers one through nine in a uh, three by three uh three by three um box of a three by three grid for what is that a total of 80 was it, is it 81 numbers right one through nine one through nine yeah i think it's 81 numbers and you have to be able to place numbers one through nine um on the grid uh in a way to where the same number does not exist in the same row or the same column and usually you'll be given numbers to start with to be able to try to figure out where all the numbers could possibly uh, be placed. And playing uh, Sudoku has been another uh, time killer of mine. And I've actually been studying like how to play Sudoku better, like how to identify tricks to uh, to know where numbers uh, could be placed, you know, and stuff like that. So there are times where I do have maybe an hour or two to where it's like, I have nothing to do. So what do I do? I can go practice maybe on my table um, or I can just uh, watch TV uh, watch Netflix, watch Disney Plus, Hulu, whatever, or come in here and play a game uh, for a little bit. <clears throat> okay, let's see here. Let's go ahead and wrap things up, shall we? Now you should notice the race is a little bit different this is a race to five three and i did see some discussion in the live chat about how are you supposed to know what my skill level is um, by just looking at the races and that's that's a very valid question uh, because i am a skill level seven uh, in apa eight ball and that's usually why you're going to see me go to five the only time i go higher than five is when i play a four or below which does happen from time to time. And Steve Cuff, yes, this is a female uh, that I'm playing up against, and she is a skill level five. Now, normally, normally, there is a uh, gentleman on this team that's a skill level six that I would be playing up against, normally. But he wasn't here on this particular night. And I didn't know that, right? Because usually when I create the rosters, I create rosters based on the best possible roster that I think uh, the opposing team can throw at me. And so I was anticipating him being there. So I put myself on the roster for tonight up to only to find out that he wasn't going to be there. So the next highest ranking uh, member on the opposing team is this lady who is a skill level five. So this is a race to five, three. And the interesting part about this match is the number of safeties you're about to see me play. 
because this is this was one that I was going to title the most safeties I've ever played in a match. Let's check it out as we wrap up the stream. Now we saw like she's breaking, right? So I I, I lost the lag here. Okay, it looks like she made a solid on the break. And she, you can see what she's saying right there because I've uh, spoken to her plenty of times about how she lifts up her cue uh, when she breaks. That's been one of the uh, uh, that's been one of the advices that I've been trying to give her about not rising up when she breaks. And just make sure that her cue follows through the cue ball to get to get as much of a powerful hit as she can. Okay, so she starts off by pocketing the three into the side pocket. Cue ball rolls forward, maybe gives her a 2-4 combination. I think that's what she was trying, and she barely avoids the scratch. But it's a good position to leave the cue ball in because I'm far away from everything. It looks like I might be able to try to cut my 13 ball into the top left corner pocket. And since I'm so close to the rail, I automatically have top spin on the cue ball. And you can see that's what I try, and I am successful. So now it looks like I might be able to shoot the 11 ball here into the side pocket. I got to figure out what I'm going to do with this, let alone these guys. Or I can take the 9 ball to go into the top right corner pocket. So it looks like I just rolled the 9 ball in. That's why I didn't bother changing the, the cue ball diagram. This is going to be another uh, top spin shot since I have to bridge over the 8. So it looks like I'm going to play the 11 into the side pocket. Cue ball can just uh, roll forward for position on the 14. Now what do I do from here? Am I going to try to break out the two stripes that are in the middle? Looks like I have a little bit of bottom spin on that on this shot here. Nope, I'm trying to I'm trying to get right behind them. I'm trying to get right here and I was not successful. I didn't I didn't hit the cue ball hard enough. Now, is that 12 ball still cuttable? I think it might be. That looks like another bottom spin shot, but what am I doing with the rest of the cue ball? Oh, I tried to cut the 15. I thought maybe I was going to cut the 12, but clearly I did not cut enough of the 15. So my opponent gets to return back to the table. Now, she has these two to deal with, and she has the five ball that she has to deal with. Now, I like that she's already looking at the six and the seven because she's in a position where she can possibly deal with them right now. So she should, rather than trying to get position uh, to deal with them. Yeah, so I, I like this decision. That worked out really nice. Yeah, rolling cue ball. She didn't hit it hard enough as she got hooked behind the eight ball. I think she, I think she had the right idea. Uh, can she see the two? Oh, she could. Never mind. I thought the eight ball was blocking her. But now a rather difficult shot here on the four or the five. Looks like she might be going for the five ball. And she overcut the five ball. Now, if that it doesn't look like that five ball blocks my blocks my ten ball. So as long as I don't make a mistake, I should be okay here. This has got to be a stun shot with a just a twist of left spin, I would think, to get position on the twelve to go to the side pocket. Well, <laughs> I, I think I probably should have put more left spin than I did. Uh, so is this gonna be? Am I still cutting this with some top spin? No, I went to the corner and pushed the cue ball past the side pocket, just barely avoiding the scratch. So here I would have to try to just uh, draw the cue ball, hopefully to this side of the table, unless the cut is too steep. Or do I follow forward? Looks like I changed my mind. Did I, did I change my mind and follow forward with left spin? I did. 
But I didn't hit it hard enough, but it looks like I might be able to try to shoot the eight ball here into the side pocket. You see, in this match here, we're not marking our pockets. We're just calling them. She was actually okay with me. Uh, I think she said to me as I got on the eight ball that I could just call it. And again, normally you're supposed to mark the pocket. And I was able to take the first rack down. Okay. Trying to make the eight ball on the break. Sitting there watching the 10 and the 1. The 10 ball finally falls. <laughs> All right. So it looks like I'm stripes. Uh, got an issue here. The nine ball looks like it can freely go into the side pocket, but what in the world am I going to do with the 13 ball? The one ball occupies this pocket from my 11 and my 15, and my 14 ball is um, obviously okay. So it looks like I'm going to take the nine ball. I changed my mind. Let's see. Yeah, so it looks like maybe the nine go in the side pocket. Probably just roll the cue ball to get position on the 12. I don't think I want a whole lot of cue. Never mind. That is not a rolling cue ball. What in the world did I do there? I got position on the 14 underneath it. Why is that? Did I want, maybe I'm trying to make sure that I can get uh, some sort of straight position on the 12 to hold it so that way I can play the 13 in the side because I saw that I glanced at uh, the 13. Okay, this allows me to get underneath the 11 and the 15, which is what I need to do in order to be able to shoot them since the one ball blocks the lower left corner pocket. But clearly, I want the cue ball to be somewhere over here, so that way I have an easier shot on the 11 ball to go here in the upper right corner pocket. This looks like a top spin shot. Woo! Got that one to float in. Now, there might be some room here. For me to squeeze that 15 ball in. And I think there is. I think that's why I'm getting ready to shoot the 15 ball. So a little bit of draw. So that way I can uh, kind of stun out to get position on the 12. And see I hit the one ball too full. So I didn't, I didn't cut it enough. If I'd have gotten uh, the 15 ball into that gap. Then I might have been able to shoot past it. <laughs> Mark V, you don't like to play with girls every time you underestimate them, or maybe you're too much of a gentleman. <laughs> I can certainly understand that. Up oh, too flat of a hit there. Not enough cut. So this gives me a shot at the 12, but I don't know if the angle is there for me to be able to spin off the rail and hit the 8 and have the 8 hit by 13. Because if, if it's not there, I, I shouldn't really be shooting this 12 ball. Looks like I might be trying it. There's got to be some left spin on this cue ball. No, I, I tried to make that. I tried to make that. Because now I need to try to... like I'm glad that I missed it. Because I've got this pocket occupied and this pocket occupied. So now my attention needs to be brought to the 13 ball. Unless, of course, I just don't have a path to it when I, if I get back to the table. Ooh, good shot there.
Ooh, a bit of an overcut there. So I can't see I can't see this ball. I can move this ball. This is the other thing that I like about looking at looking back at my own videos. I should not be doing this. Let's see what am I going to do? Play rail first, spin the cue ball around. Unless I'm convinced that that 13 ball goes into the side pocket. That's the only reason why I'm going to that's the only reason why I'm doing this. The third I I must believe that the 13 ball goes into the side pocket or there is a window where I can shoot the 13 ball into the corner because otherwise I should not be doing this. I should have moved the 13 ball like out into the open. I've got this pocket protected from her three ball. So I, I, I don't think I, I would have to worry about that. Because this puts me in a tricky situation, especially since my last remaining shots, they have to be so precise. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, MDU, uh, 2112, the 13, eight into the 12. Yeah. I, I can see that, um, as a decent shot. My only concern about doing that is what if the eight ball stops in front of the pocket, right? Cause if the, if I knew that I could shoot that in such a way to where I can clip the 12 and, and have the eight ball move, then I think that would be, um, a really good shot to take. You can see there. So yeah, so the 13 ball did go into the side pocket. So that's kind of how I look at it in retrospect where I probably should not have played those two stripes the way that I did. I should have just moved the 13 ball um, to a better location, then be able to use those two, uh, those two pocket hangers to be able to maneuver around the table. But MDU, uh, you're, you're not wrong. Like that, that is an obvious suggestion, but that would be my concern of being able to play uh, that combination. I really don't like involving the eight ball in a combination, which I think can be understood why. Because you know, I certainly don't want the eight ball to be falling early. Oh, that was a good shot. She's looking to see if the two ball will squeeze by the 13 again. She's She actually looks pretty safe to shoot the two uh, into the upper left corner pocket and use my ball to block um, the cue ball from scratching. I think that's a, I think that's a decent option because otherwise she needs to just roll the ball, roll the two ball to the rail and have it come back out and put the cue ball up here because then I don't have a shot. Oh, holy cow. Or you, or you could do something like that. Wow. Okay, for, for, forget forget the defensive shot. Just make the ball. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh, what a shot. Wow, what an out. What an out. I love it. You can see there kind of the, the forcing your way through, picking up your bridge hand off of the table and stuff. That's something that she's fully aware of that she needs to that she needs to work on so she can have better control um, of her breaks. Uh, but she made a ball on the break. What did she make? I don't see the one ball. So is she solids? Oh, looked a, looked a little rush on that one. Looked a little rush on that one. All right, so I get to come to the table. And I see seven stripes. Uh, D. Rick, you're not, uh, you are correct on that one. Some players don't see the percentages as low as others. Um, I completely agree with that. And that's usually what I uh, try to um, argue with on a lot of people about doing certain things because uh, their arguments are when I tell them that it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a great shot to take. Um, and their their main argument is, but I made the shot. 
right? And so I say, okay, cool. You made the shot at the crucial moment that you probably needed to make the shot. So there's nothing I can argue about that. However, I was like, if I were to have you set that shot up again out of 10 times, how many times would you make it? And if you're not, if you're not sitting somewhere between 70 to 80%, then that's probably why you shouldn't take the shot. Sometimes, sometimes, every now and again, you have to go for that low percentage shot every now and again, that's going to come up. You don't always want to play, you know, the, you don't always have to play the higher percentage shots every single solitary time. Every once in a while, there's going to be that very low percent shots where if you can nail it at the critical moment, it either gets you back in line to finish the table or allows you to win the game. All right. So while I was blabbing on there, I think I did at least make a stripe. I can see I have a stripe here that's tied up that looks like my 15 ball. So I'm, I, I have to be thinking about how am I going to try to break it out? So one thing I hope every one thing I hope everybody notices about at least my playing style, especially in eight ball, is that I don't just get down and start shooting. Now that was on purpose. I can tell that was on purpose. That is not me missing. That is me. Per There's one safety again, the most safeties I've ever played. I set that ten ball up there so that way I can shoot it in and break out my fifteen ball. So there, there's at least safety number one that I played in, in this match so far. Seeing that there was no way for me to be able to develop the 15 ball, so I put a ball near near a pocket that allows me to break it out, like probably right now. I'm probably gonna break the 15 ball out right now. Except <laughs> I didn't want I didn't want the cue ball to stay tied up next to the seven. So let's see, is this a is this a safety kick or uh, am I going for something? Well, the it was a legal kick. Uh, the two ball got to the rail. I, I would have to think that that was probably a safety kick. I don't think I was trying to uh, play to uh, make the 14 ball. But if you were, if you look at when I approach the table, I don't just immediately just get down and just start shooting. Like especially if there's an obvious ball staring at the cue ball for me to shoot at, I do try to walk around the table at least one time, acknowledge where all of the the balls that I have for the set are on the table, figure out where they are, so that way I can start developing a route. Now sometimes I do develop like the entire table route where I'll, because like they'll normally say like you know plan two or three balls ahead. Well, if the layout of the table allows me to do so, I will plan out the entire run out before I even shoot the first ball. Uh, but if the layout doesn't allow me to do that, then that's where I will do like two to three balls here, two to three balls here. Or like I said before, I will acknowledge to myself that this table isn't runnable by me. Like the percentage is so low. So therefore, I know I'm going to play uh, one or two balls and then set up another ball uh, or or take a ball that's almost got lucky there or, or take a ball that's not in a good position and try to put it in a better position with hopes, of course, that I do get back to the table because that's the risk that I'm going to be taking any time that um, I'm playing uh, some sort of a defensive shot. Okay, so the 15 ball is at least back out in the open now. The 12 ball looks like that's going in. So this looks like a little bit of bottom left. What am I going to do with this guy? Is this going to be another safety to where I'm going to uh, take this pocket away from her? Uh, Steve Cuff, you are correct. That is something I've also made her aware of that um, uh, she is continuously uh, working on. Yeah, so it looks like here comes another. Uh, look, uh, maybe I could squeeze it past there. Otherwise, it's another safety. I can squeeze past it. Okay. <laughs> Look at, you can see the disappointment on me because this three ball was not supposed to get in my way uh, of my 11 ball. So now I have to shoot at this 14 ball. 
uh, what is this? This looks like maybe with some uh, low right. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said low right. I should have said stun right. Gives me position uh, for the 15 ball because I didn't really try to risk landing in this window here to be able to cut the 11 ball because I could easily um, overdo this and then just lose the shot. Yeah, <laughs> that's always the that's always the name of the game that you play better safeties on yourself than your opponent plays uh, safeties on. So here I would have to think this has to be done with some, uh, no, I was going to say low left. So that looks like stun left again. So I must be wanting the left spin to do the work for me when it hits that rail. Kind of like that because that puts me in the window that I was talking about. So now I think if I just play this with some top spin, I think I want the cue ball to go from one side rail to the other. I just don't know if I'm doing one more. It's going to be at least two. And actually that's not top spin. That's, that's probably just this. Yeah, going from one side rail to the next. And then play the eight ball into the same corner pocket. Oh, I think I almost ran into somebody on the other table. And then they saw that I was shooting the eight ball and they said, go ahead and shoot. So there's that there. I'm up two to one now. There's a pretty decent uh, spread of a break. Like I was saying before, with the second ball break, it doesn't always mean that the key, the balls are going to go from one side of the table to the other. If you actually contact the second row, and I would have to say in uh, uh, with uh, you know the the proper types of gaps that that might be in the rack, you know, because it's not like your opponents are, are purposely trying to manipulate the rack and put gaps in certain areas, but that you'd actually get a rather opening type of spread on the break. Now, I think I made the four ball, which means I have to be shooting the two ball. Um, and again, right, the two ball is the obvious shot that I have to take. But do you see me just getting down and shooting it? No, you're seeing me trying to figure out what kind of route am I possibly going to create for myself. Because when I shoot this two ball in, probably a rolling cue ball with right spin, the cue ball is going to go from one side rail to the other and come back out over here for position on the six. Just like that. Because then I have to start figuring out what am I going to do with the rest of these, especially since the window that I have between the, the nine ball and the pocket is pretty small. So what do I do from here? Do I play for the window here to get position on the seven, which means I can just allow the cue ball to come to the rail here and then kind of roll in between uh, the nine ball and the three? It doesn't look like it unless this is a drag shot. It looks like a little bit of uh, bottom left. Yep, it was a drag shot, and I think it was a failed drag shot. So if anybody's unfamiliar with what a drag shot is, is putting bottom spin on the cue ball in such a way to where as the cue ball is traveling over to the object ball, it's spinning backwards, but then the backspin will die out, and then it'll slide, and then it'll move forward. And so what I want to happen is I want that forward roll to pick up right before it hits the object ball. And so that it's, it's, it's obviously different uh, than just hitting with uh, top spin because at least – with the, um, I didn't realize I can cut the one ball in the side pocket. At least with the top spin shot, I would have to hit it so much softer just to be able to produce the same result. Whereas in with a drag shot, I can actually hit it a little bit firmer, but then just make sure that the timing is correctly to where the back spin dies out and then it actually has the forward roll as if I did hit it with top spin. Okay, good shot there. But then this cuts off access to the corner pocket, I think. As you can see, I have a shot at the seven ball. The seven, uh, I should be able to get position on the three, but I, I don't think I have a shot now because I blocked the pocket. I think this is this was this was this is going on a break and run uh, right now. Right, so I don't know, like can can I squeeze past that uh, 14 ball? There I am looking just to make sure.
So it looks like I'm playing this with a little bit of low left. Oh, I got it in there, but man, it didn't fall. Now, you want to know why this is going to be the, the most safeties I've ever played? This is a skill level 5 player. Watch what she does here. If, if I'm thinking of the, the correct rack, because I am starting to remember what happened uh, during this match here. Gently rolls that ball in, no issue there. And do the same thing with the, uh, the 13 ball. Oh, just barely makes that one. <laughs> Look at that. It's just like, yeah, just enough power to be able to roll that ball in. Okay, good shot there. And then she misses the 12. Now, I don't think there's room back there for you to make it, right? So the fact that she misses the 12, she could care less. Right? She's in a position where I'm probably going to give her ball in hand. All right, so watch what I do here. So close to the rail. This is just with topspin. Okay, that's on purpose. All right, I'm literally trying to crowd that corner pocket uh, with her stuff. I had to remind her that she had ball in hand anyway, uh, since I uh, intentionally fouled. Because all I can hope for is some sort of mistake where she does something like this, pockets my ball, and, and, then, uh, and then isn't able to finish the table. Right? So making that ball was probably not the best uh, decision in the world. She could have purposely missed that ball and just had more stuff to deal with because right now, now, now we're just seeing like who, who, who's going to get the, their ball into the pocket first. Right? So what do I do here? I can't do anything, right? So I got to do another safety. And if I remember correctly, I think I uh, I think I banked the 14 ball away. Yeah, see, I I I've I've uh, I've fouled, but I've also opened the pocket up. So again, I have to tell her that uh, she she's got ball in hand, but now that the pocket's opened up, she what she should do is close it back up. Right, because you see, she's not doing that. She's going for the out, and she gets lucky with that. <laughs> look at that! I think, look at that. She was trying to make the 14 ball. Watch the 12 ball. Look at that. <laughs> there I was trying to play as conservative as I can. And she hit that a little too hard. She's going to have to cut this into the side pocket. Yep. Oh, and she undercuts the ball. Am I going to have a shot? Okay. I've got a shot. <laughs> Let's see here. What is that? That looks like bottom left. Oh, never mind. That's just straight bottom. This is a, uh, playing the eight ball into the uh, opposite corner pocket. Op opposite diagonal corner pocket. And then probably with uh, some draw again. Or a stop sh stop shot. Actually, probably somewhere up here. Yeah, a bit of a stop shot. Whew! And I managed to steal that rack. So did y'all see, uh, see what I meant? Let's go back and look at this. This section right here. Now, she, she could have won. Uh, by all means, she could have won. She just overhit the, the last stripe getting position on the eight ball. But what I was thinking 
was that she should have taken uh, the, the cue ball like here and then pushed this ball back over here. Or if any, or if anything, bank this ball um, away from the pocket so that way she can use it. And then, le and then of course, leave the cue ball right here to where I've got nothing because her 12 ball is still blocking me. That's kind of what I was thinking to where since since I've opened this up, if she messes up now, I hopefully will have some sort of access uh, to, to my three ball. So if she would have seen that immediately, then all she has to do is just close the opening uh, again. And then we just sit there and we're just trading back and forth of doing simple, uh, rather simple safeties because there's not a whole lot of object ball movement and there's not a whole lot of cue ball movement. And so finally somebody makes a mistake. Who has the most patience to wait for the mistake in order to be able to win the rack? But she she had her chance uh, to be able to finish it, just was unfortunate and couldn't. And she had been, she had been on the hill. Oh, a scratch. So I'm certainly glad that I didn't uh, uh, make the eight ball on that one. Uh, let's see. G-Mags, what would have happened if you pocketed your ball after touching her ball first? Well, given the fact that you say I touched um, the one of uh, one of hers uh, first, it's an automatic foul. You know, if, if you're solids, you have to contact a solid first. Because if you contact a stripe first, it's a foul. And much like the opposite, if you are stripes, you have to contact a stripe first. So therefore, if you contact a solid or the eight ball, then it's a foul. Doesn't matter if you pocket your ball or not. Yeah, so there I had to remind her that um, that the uh, the object ball that she wanted to shoot at needs to be past uh, the head string since I scratched um, on the break. And the 13 ball is not past the head string. So she, ha she has to try to shoot at something else. So it looks like she's going to take the nine ball. She wants to be stripes. Gently plays the nine ball in. I like the way she shot that one. It's got automatic position for the 15. And if she does the same thing, she should get automatic position for the 11 ball. Kind of like that. She also has automatic position for the 13 ball, but I think here you're supposed to take the 11. I mean, you're, you're on it right now. There's no reason to not take it. But what do we do here? She's got a stripe here that she eventually has to deal with, but she misses the 11. I come to the table. I can see that I can shoot the 7 ball, and I'll most likely try to go two rails or one rail to break up the 6 and the 5, so probably some uh, left spin. Not enough left spin. You can see me kind of twist my head there like, ah, I knew I, I knew that I missed it. So I probably needed more left spin to make sure I come off that short rail correctly. This looks like I'm going for the three ball with uh, a little bit of bottom right spin, I think. I can't tell if I knocked my six ball loose or not, like if I if I can actually fit back here. All right, I'm checking it out. So I must be able to fit back there if I'm going to shoot at it. It's probably a rail first shot. You can see I got some draw on the ball. There we go. That obviously opens up the five ball. I think the four ball is fine. I think it passes by the 12 okay. This looks like uh, maybe some right spin. Just roll the ball. Oh, I just rolled it. Never mind. So no spin. Position on the two. Drawback for position on the one, I would think. I got a small angle here. So this is probably just a twist of left spin. Yeah, maybe maybe just maybe I just drew it. 
so close to the rail that I automatically have to be putting top spin on the ball, but I want to gently push this one ball in, get position on the four. And I think here, this is probably going to be with a little bit of, I think this is uh, just a little above center with some left spin. I'm going to go two, I think I'm going to go two rails around like this. One, two, spin over here, and then out into the open for the eight ball to go into the upper left corner pocket. And this should put me on the hill. There we go. Look at the eight ball. Look at the eight ball. <laughs> Almost tracked right over towards the side pocket. All right. I think I did see a ball fall on the break. I'm shaking my head. Do I not have a shot? Let's see. Three, six, seven. I'm stripes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I'm stripes. So instant trouble ball there, instant trouble ball there. You saw me place my stick down onto the table to where the first thing I usually try to do is identify all my trouble spots, which is also identifying where are all of the balls that are in my set so I can try to figure out how I'm going to deal with them all. Now, it doesn't look like I have a decent opener. It looks like I'm shooting the 11 ball into the uh, corner pocket. Wiped its feet on the way in. Yeah, Dusty Table. I've, I, the spam bots uh, walk in here um, every now and again. They're not flooding uh, the, the live chat like they did before. So that's why I kind of just le uh, leave them alone. There was some that I've had before to where we like, like they'll spam like three messages in a row. Um, and I eventually would have to um, make sure that I kick that username uh, out. Th this spam bot here, the name keeps changing, so it, it's not going to do me any good to to ban uh, uh, whoever that uh, that that username because it'll just be another username that pops in. Okay, that looked like that was just with a little bit of draw. Not sure why I'm just shooting balls in i don't know what i'm going to do here and i don't know what i'm going to do here that looks like i'm looking at the uh, uh angle there to where if i shoot that ball in will i be able to come back over here like this and be able to break my 14 ball out away from the uh the eight ball so this looks like a top spin hit and i think i'm a little uh, a little too flat i wanted the cue ball to be like somewhere right around here But looks like I'm still going to try it anyway. It looks like I got a lot of bottom spin. There's got to be a twist of right spin on this. Yeah, see right there? I'm trying to break out the 14 ball and I missed it. All right, so you see the way I just lined up the 10 ball? That means I'm going to try to carom the 10 ball off of the 6, maybe even off of the 4 to go towards this pocket here. Kind of like that. But I made it worse. <laughs> oh, so I must have bumped her seven ball. And I'm saying like, I, I, and I've told her, it's like, I think I accidentally moved your seven ball. Do you want me to move it back? Because uh, APA is not all ball foul. But when you do disturb another ball, you do try to uh, put it back uh, to its closest original position. All right, so let's see here. Just place this with some top spins coming back up table. Not a bad decision. She's got the one and the five that she can use to develop her six. So she's actually in a pretty good position here. Okay, play the two. Gently rolls the two in. Automatic position for the seven. Okay, gently plays that and gets automatic position for the three. So this is what I like to see um, where you're not putting in a whole lot of effort 
because the um, you're getting just natural position. Uh, D. Rick, you're wanting to know what a spam bot is. So if you look right above Dusty Tables um, chat message that identifies a spam bot, you'll see that there's a Caleb Myers that says vum.ngo. That is supposed to be a hyperlink. They want you to go to vum.ngo URL, which I'm not going to advise that you do. Right. Uh, so you should basically just ignore that message because I, I don't know what they're possibly spamming um, or, you know, what, what could possibly be at that destination. But if you if you watch later on, eventually somebody else under a different username is going to is going to is going to put something in the live chat that's going to be very similar to that message. And that's why I was saying before. Good kick shot. That's what I was saying before. Um, about how there, it does me no good to just kick the person um, out of the live stream when they're just going to come back in under a different username. So I obviously can't make the 10, right? So there's there's nothing that I can do here except play a defensive shot, right? So another defense, you know, that's what I'm saying. The most safeties I've ever played in the match. Gently graze the, uh, the 10 ball and try to leave the cue ball directly behind the 10 ball. And MDU uh, 2112 ex explains perfectly what a spam bot is. I can actually hear um, some fireworks um, outside my uh, my office window here. I guess people are already celebrating the, uh, the new year, or firecrackers maybe. Oh, what a two rail kick to be able to hit the five ball. That was awesome. So now I'd have to think here that I am just going to separate uh, the, the one and the six uh, from my 14 ball. Yeah, so I've at least hopefully created um, a combo, right? But another defensive shot. And then she answers back with a defensive shot of her own and puts the one ball back. That's kind of what I was talking about that, that could have happened on the last rack. All right, so I, I like this stuff. So I come back in and look what I do. Play another defensive shot. The only thing is, is that I'm making sure that I try to keep that cue ball in a position that forces her to do something else. So like right now, she has no access to to any of her balls. So she has to kick um, at, so she's not kicking at the at the five ball, right? The eight ball's there. So she has to kick at hopefully the one or the six. Um, and, ho and I'm hoping she'll kick at the one or the six, I should say, because otherwise, uh, if she kicks at the one or the six and breaks my stuff out, then I'm good to go. Right, so she makes a smart choice and tries to go after the five ball again and ends up giving me ball in hand. Right, so the only thing I can do is the same exact thing. Make sure that I start spreading that clutter open, keeping the cue ball controlled to where she has to continuously do what she does until hopefully I create some sort of shot to where I can finally attack. So watch what I do here. Right, there's the combo. Right, the combo is there now. And again, I, I, I don't think she obviously can't see the six. She obviously can't see the five, but I think she could see the one ball. So if she could see the one ball, she would definitely want to be able to clip the one ball and hopefully not leave me in a position where I can take the combo. Looks like she's waiting on another player. So I'm just going to fast forward a bit. Here we go. So she doesn't want to give me access to that combo that I've created. And I think here we saw that the 10 ball moved. And I think and I think I tried I think I tried telling her that the 10 ball did move. Uh, but she was convinced that the 10 ball didn't move. So therefore I didn't I just didn't want to argue, so I just left it there. Because I'm usually not a person that would want to argue um, over um, over anything, really. 
Uh, Kyler Kerr, there is no three foul um, in APA, even even for APA nine ball, because APA nine ball runs on a point system, uh, and three fouling in uh, nine ball doesn't do anything in, in, uh, uh, for your points. So here I have to kick. And you can see here I'm not trying to do anything uh, anything too crazy, so I end up fouling. Since I hit, I hit the 10 ball, but then nothing hits the rail afterwards. Speed up a bit. Oh, there she is. So now with ball in hand, three open balls, this should be this should be pretty much an open and shut case. She decides to start with the six. I'm surprised not the one. The six looks like it passes by my two stripes to go into the lower right corner pocket. Not like there's anything wrong with doing what she did there. I don't consider that to be an issue. So, because I would think here, I would probably play the five. The one ball is the easier shot, but... There's no telling what you can get with the uh, with the five afterwards unless you come two rails around to shoot the five in the same uh, side pocket. But she clips the five. So that actually works out. That actually works out. A little slight draw, but then she scratches on the – well, that not – I was going to say not uh, – uh, I was going to say scratch on the eight. She doesn't scratch on the eight. She scratches on her last shot. And so now I have ball in hand, and I'm looking to see if the two balls are frozen to see if I can create some sort of frictional throw shot to where I can make a ball. But I can't. So what do I do? I'm going to play another safety. All right, so what's the safety that I play? Well, I got to make sure that I separate these two balls. Um, and then le and then make sure that I protect the cue ball. Just like that. So if I'm to get ball in hand again, I have a wide open table. And I remember this part right here. What you guys and gals are about to see, I think, is just flat out amazing. What would y'all do here? You see, she's calling the top left corner pocket. What would y'all do here? <laughs> MDU tw uh, 2112, you're saying the Efren Reyes Z kick? That's one potential option. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Barely misses it. <laughs> like, wow. Like, seriously. How do you find how do you find that? Like, I'm gonna have to remember that type of route. Like, that was freaking amazing. But here I shoot the 10 ball into the corner pocket. That way I can just cut the 14 ball into the side pocket, gently float up uh, for position on the eight to be able to close the set out uh, five to one. But that three, almost four railer to be able to get there, like, holy crap, like everybody was on the edge of their seat uh, when uh, when she shot that shot. But man, I was able to take that match and I'm and I win five to one. And so Anybody that's not familiar um, with APA and the scoring system, the way this works, if I were to like, if I were to win five to zero in any of my matches, which I think every match that we saw here, I didn't win five to zero. But if I win five to zero, then what I end up scoring is three points for my team, and then the uh, the opposing team gets zero points. Now, if the opponent manages to win one game, which they did, in this one here, they won five to one. Then I get two points for the team 
while the opposing team gets zero. Now, if it ever comes down to a hill-hill match, then whoever wins the last match will win two points for their team, and the opposing team will get one point. So I don't think any of my matches that I reviewed tonight um, had a hill-hill match, so I think every one of my matches I had won two to zero, or I scored two points to their zero points as far as the team totals are, are concerned. So sometimes I'm able to pull off uh, three to zero matches. Sometimes um, I, I, I've had some hill-hill matches um, that I've reviewed. So you get a little bit of everything. But that's pretty much going to conclude the live stream. I hope everybody was able to um, enjoy the matches. Both, I think, the first match and the third match were kind of, eh, you know, like not the, not the best performances. And this match here, I think, would have to be the most exciting one, I would have to think, because, like, my opponent, uh, though a lower skill level uh, than me, but a rather smart player, knows when to not go for crazy stuff or tries not to go for crazy stuff, especially, like, when I had my ball uh, sitting in the corner pocket and, you know, could dish out safeties just as much as I could dish, uh, dish out safeties and stuff. And so it's good to see that, when you run into players like that, that know to not always just try to go for the run out, right? Just because uh, they, they can be honest with themselves and saying like, I can't do this. So therefore they just play some sort of a defensive shot. The only thing that I've seen on most uh, uh, lower skill level players is that they do that towards the end. Like, like we saw on that one rack where I had the ball sitting in the corner pocket and then she knew not to try to go for anything at that point until she fi until she figured there was a point in time where it was and every safety that I attempted to play I attempted to play a safety that where I can contain the cue ball or hopefully she has to kick at it but I also eventually create a scenario that allows me to do something because there are uh, simple safeties to where you literally just like nudge a ball and try to get a ball to hit a route and you don't really move anything and those those don't those kind of safeties don't really benefit you at all because um, unless, of course, the opponent just like gives you ball in hand, because then eventually you have to figure out how to develop the clutter to where you can hopefully make a ball break open the clutter or whatever. So you got to be careful sometimes when you're playing safeties and you don't want to just gently tap an object ball to where it barely moves and then just put something into the into the rail. Always try to make sure that you're developing uh, the balls as best as you can, as well as containing the cue ball, pretty much like how I did um, on, or tried to do. Um, on this match here but uh let's see here it is almost 7 p.m uh where i'm at i think sign up for the tournament starts at 7 30 so i need to pretty much go ahead and wrap things up and get ready to go i want to thank all of y'all for being here and for the 50 that are remaining to be here i want to wish all of y'all a happy new year and let's see what 2022 can do for us and of course happy new year to everybody that was here even from even from the beginning and then happy new year to anybody that happens to catch the replay of this so i will be seeing y'all later um not entirely sure what my next recorded video um is going to be but hopefully in the next couple of days or so i will be making another attempt at my road to 100 in straight pool series since my current best is 35 but in the meantime have a good night and once again happy new year and take care